Do any members want to declare an interest in these matters? No. I, I suppose, uh, Chair, I'd better declare it the last time uh, that I am um, a landlord to a yeah. certain degree, okay. so I'd better declare it. Okay. So am I. So am I. So am I. Dominoes falling there. It seems to be my tenant, I don't know. <laughs> okay. And again, members, just to keep your supplementary questions brief and clear. Good afternoon. Okay, members, um, just jumping back a little here, can we agree the minutes of the meeting of Wednesday, the 7th of May? Ch Chair. Can I comment on the apologies? Whilst I'm reported as an apology, I was working with another committee, and I, I know it's not the practice here, uh, but it does irritate slightly that uh, I not attend certain meetings to get commented on. Yeah. There are reasons why we do not attend certain meetings, and I think that we should look at this in the round. As, as to you know, okay, yes, the, the recording of, of attendance at meetings or otherwise. Because it crosses over with another committee yeah. event. Okay. Um, yeah, we can take that back to our next meeting and. Okay. The members minutes agreed. Okay, members. Um, today we have us with us is the uh, Mr. Will Hare, accounting officer in the Department for Social Development. So thank you for joining us today, um, and apologies in the delay in starting. Mr. Hare, would you like to introduce your team? Yes, uh, uh, Chairman. Uh, that's just, I'm, I'm joined first of all, Mike Slightbody, who is acting chief executive of the, the housing executive, Jerry Flynn, uh, director of landlord services in the housing executive, Cameron Walt, uh, chief executive of the Northern Ireland Federation of Housing Associations, and Jim Wilkinson, who is my director of housing in DSD. These are all very welcome. And members, just for your own information, the biographies of all witnesses are at pages 1, 11 to 16 of your electronic pack. So again, these are very welcome. And members, I will start the question today. And members, as I alluded to earlier, if members have supplementary points to make, I would ask that you hold those until the end, as they may be straying into the areas of other members who may wish to ask a particular question. Okay, um, Mr. Hare, Ms. Lightbody, and Mr. Watt. Um, in terms of the publication of the audit office report, and since that, uh, the agreed attendancy fraud strategy in April 2013, which lists a number of measures on detecting tenancy uh, fraud, including data sharing and tightening procedures on new and existing tenants and taking a more robust approach to tenancy fraud. Would you agree that the housing executive and the housing associations have been slow in responding proactively to this serious problem? And I, I appreciate that question to Mr Hare, Mrs Lightbody and Mr Watt. So whatever direction you want to start in. Uh, Chair, can, can I start off and then I'll ask my colleagues to uh, um, um, uh, next from the House Secretary uh, Cameron from the House. Um, you know the, the history of, of this issue where, uh, I mean, I suppose the issue was particularly brought up from uh, work in 2009 from DCLG, which started the issues. Uh, the housing executive previous year in 2008 had done Operation Blitz, where they had looked at uh, 10,000 400 of its properties and actually looked at this issue on a different, they'd been looking at a question about uh, an occupancy issue, but at that time they had looked at that, that question and found they'd repossessed 16 houses from that exercise. They spent £200,000 on that exercise and they recovered 16 houses. So they, at that time, had quite a clear vision from the, the early stages about the sense of, of some of the issues here. And that was very much in their thought. But I was really pleased that when in, in so November 2012, um, DCLG produces its document, which is referred to in the report. By December, that was in front of the senior team of the housing executive. By January, they had a draft out for consultation with the, the central uh, housing organisations, and they wait then for the conclusion of the audit office report um, in uh, November and, and to get to see where the audit office is in its thinking, is going, 
and by uh, November they have got it. The strategy document, which the committee has, has gone through its board. They have set up an action plan by that time, and are doing basically. They already have been doing a great deal of work, which was in, in line with this process. So, but they have already formulated an action plan, and they have that in place. So we have an Northern Ireland Fraud Forum established. Uh, we are, they are already members of the National Fraud, for, Fraud Forum and are very active members of the National Fraud Forum, and they are doing a range of issues there. I'm going to ask Mags to, to look at that issue, and at the same time then, the Housing Federation are <coughs> working through their members. So uh, we, I say all of us, really welcome this report. It is a complex area of fraud uh, to deal with. We have, uh, there has been a major shift in thinking, and we've gone very much with that thinking and are keen to explore it in a sensitive and clear manner to fit into the Northern Ireland circumstances. But I, 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 I'm pleased by the, the pace that we've worked on here. We don't doubt there's more to be, a lot to be done in this process, um, but I think there has been active handling in this process. Max, do you want to comment? Thank you. Um, Chair, in terms of the housing executive's role, members will be aware we're, we're more than just a, a very large landlord. So in terms of the seriousness around this issue with housing assessment responsibilities and homelessness, making sure every property is used appropriately, is occupied and occupied by the right person, it is our, our day job and always has been. Tenancy fraud is, is probably a fairly new badge for a particular aspect of what we would always have, have called just sound housing management. And I'm, I'm sure my colleagues from the Housing Association um, sector will, will comment appropriately as well. But it's always been a bit that we've had a day focus on for our, our staff out in the sticks, is making sure properties are turned around quickly, allocated appropriately, and occupied by, by the right person. Some of our actions, just taking you through those, those bits before the tenancy fraud banner, um, I think very usefully is, is now presented. Uh, back in 2001, we created the first neighbourhood wardens with a sole focus of being in the communities, supplementing housing officers to make sure properties were, were being occupied as well as looking after the environment. 2008, we had um, our first big general stamp out frauds campaign. Um, and we've always looked nationally to what's happening over to, to GB as well as internally for that best practice and what's new in housing. So we've been active members of Housemark, a, a national body in GB, where we would share our innovations, share our best practice and hear from others. Um, so back, as, as my colleague has mentioned, 2008, as part of that stamp out fraud campaign, we did our first big targeted audit of properties. Knowing the intelligence that was coming from elsewhere, flatted properties are at that high risk area because they may be um, easier to hide issues in. So we did a blitz round about uh, flats, masonettes and high rise stock. Um, spent a lot of money on it to do that door to door chapping of checking who's there uh, and identities, etc. From that intensive campaign then, as my colleague mentioned, um, 62 abandonment notices were served where we, after repeated attempts, couldn't establish who was there. And we have, through our tenancy rights, uh, our um, agreement with the occupier, we have rights where we suspect a property isn't being occupied to serve notice and then without court process to be able to take those properties back quickly and get them back into occupation. So the numbers there, it was 0.6 of the properties that we did that intensive activity on that we went into formal process and then subsequently took 15 properties back, no contact, let that process run. It's a very cost effective process to get the houses back quickly and doesn't have us having to get near costly and time consuming court action. Um, looking again to what was happening in, in GB and the reports round about the Audit Commission's activity in 2009, while those were happening in GB, we were picking up the discussions and in each of those taking those documents and kind of checking them in, in our policies and our approaches. So picking up some of, some of the um, potential high numbers that we were seeing from GB, we were taking those documents and just making sure we, we were current um, in terms of our actions. Um, so on the back of that, really building up the, the campaigns around about 
um, the big culture change of calling it what it is, tenancy fraud. So we were starting our activity back in 2009 with public campaigns to make sure not only we were resourcing to detect these issues, but had our customers as an additional layer of eyes and ears on the ground and the ability to tell us about these issues. Um, so we did that through publicity campaigns and, and badged it for the first time, stamp out fraud. Um, we worked through that process again, seeing, uh, and members will be aware from, from the very useful audit report that's before you, um, DCLG's commentary and consultations round about fraud. Again, we had taken the learning that was coming out of that and matched it against their policy approaches. So we were already looking at data matching at that point. Um, we had established internally in the organisation for staff a whistleblowing policy, and that was back at 2006-07, um, and had dedicated staff around about the counter-fraud issue, not just tenancy fraud, but any range of, of, of issues. So we established a small but expert team within our organisation to bring some of the kind of high-level intelligence gathering into to our organisation. Um, moving forward to 2001 and the National Fraud Authority Guide, um, again, we didn't specifically respond as a consultee, but we're checking in amongst our activities to see if there was any new learning from that. And this is where we start to, to formalise that we want a specific action round about the banner of tenancy fraud. We created a discussion paper around about December 2012. Um, that was for internal discussions to make sure we were learning from our own managers and staff on the ground. And that ran through to a presentation to our central housing community network um, that was with this morning on another issue. So a very active tenant engagement platform bringing together reps from across Northern Ireland to test their views and appetite because we were going to be going out there and again cranking up the issue of or starting to describe it as, as fraud uh, and making sure our tenants knew why we were going down that path, the very serious issue of making sure tenancies are occupied and occupied by the right person. Um, we disseminated that down through a local community network, so all of the local tenant bodies were getting their mark on that activity. And that culminated in us going in April 2013 to our board with our first tenancy fraud strategy. Knowing, of course, that the activity was ongoing with the audit office, we had devised an outline action plan of the new things we wanted to do and worked through to make sure we waited to the report come out that's before, before you um, and checked again whether there was anything additional that we wanted to do. So we went back to our board in October of 2013 with the action plan and have been going through the, the activity um, on that just now. Uh, we are doing, um, you, you'll have the detail of the activity that sits within the fraud strategy and the action plan. And we'll be going back to our board with another refresh of that. I think even today it's such a live topic that there is always going to be issues that we add to it. So one recent issue that's come up through staff suggestion is our multi-storey flats, for example, have fob activity to control access. So we want to use that as another form of intelligence to use technology to make sure properties are being occupied. Um, we've always balanced this, though, by making sure that we are targeted in our approach. I think members will be aware in representing constituents. The vast majority of our tenants are honest, law-abiding. So with our activity, we've tried to front a lot of what we're doing in our contacts, our audits, first and foremost, as just good customer service, being there with our tenants, visiting, making sure everything is fine at home. But it gives us that activity again to make sure houses are occupied. We've been through some recent activity and um, we'll hopefully be able to share the details where we've been doing another planned and targeted audit. And that was picking up some of the best practice that was coming out of the audit report. One of the suggestions of checking, it, checking repairs activity <coughs> over the past two, three years, we've decided to look at just one year. So bring that, that time scale in and we'll be able to, to share with you today where we are in that visit where we've selected 2,800 houses that haven't had a repair in the last year. 
so haven't had active engagement with us and going out to make sure those properties are occupied. So I'll be happy to, to share with you today the progress from that. Um, and all of that's being used again to, to ensure we're giving this the right attention, really focusing on what's the level of problem within our stock and how can we ensure that we're proportionate but tackling this and giving confidence to, to PAC on that front and our own board. Thanks, Cameron, do you want to Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, like the colleagues, I'd like to um, welcome this report as well. I think that uh, housing associations have been doing a lot of good work um, through, through uh, systematic, robust housing management that has picked up tenancy fraud, other types of fraud. Um, but I, I, I do accept that there is always um, room for improvement, and I think that this, this report is helping all of us, I think, to develop a more um, structured and proactive approach that, that I am sure will help us to, to do even better. Um, for a number of years, as, as the report acknowledges, our, our members have been undertaking a range of tenant surveys, um, censuses, and audits, um, and that work has intensified in recent years. I think the part of that is as a result of the, the prospect of welfare reform and it being business critical for our members to understand um, their ten our, our tenants in, in, in more detail um, and understand our tenants uh, in more detail than ever. And, um, We've also obviously had um, anti-fraud strategies in place. Housing associations have had to have those as a, as a, a regulatory requirement. Um, we, we accept that dedicated tenancy fraud strategies do have uh, a role, though. And uh, since this report, our members have been working in, in detail to uh, develop and refine those and adopt those. Um, and I'm confident that by over the next few months, um, virtually every association will, will have one finalised and in place. And we're working with colleagues, obviously, to, um, to implement the, the rest of the recommendations, um, including establishing the Northern Ireland Tenancy Fraud Forum, sharing good practice, uh, running joint training with the housing executive, um, working on more, more systematic use of um, photographic evidence, getting the information sharing protocols in place and what have you. So I, I think that this is a, a valuable report. Associations have been doing good work, um, but we can do more and we look forward to working with colleagues to ensure that we refocus and reframe our efforts to do even better than we have been. A spotlight programme in terms of the figures that, that they alluded to, um, over 2,500 uh, and maybe more. Uh, do you believe that that figure is the right figure, or is it serious and higher? Jim, could you pass the two and a half thousand referred to in the spotlight mm -hmm. programme referred to particularly fraudulently was, occupied tenants? Uh, uh, it's coming, I think, from the the audit office the kind of calculation from the two percent uh, process. I mean that that that, that those, um, We, um, I mean that's. Uh, as you've seen in the documents from DCLG and also, I mean, that is a, a level which they have extrapolated from a survey of 6,000 houses in, uh, on chosen, in, in London in that process. Um, that has been, uh, and we think it's a useful, it shows that there is real size and issues in this process. I think it'll take us several years of surveying. And we're, one of the issues going to is, is to go and start working on these uh, regular audits of our process. Before we get a sense of that process, is that picking up a different uh, structure of, of housing uh, and, and, and population movement than we're finding in Northern Ireland or not? As I say, the surveys we have, we, there's three surveys to date that are, 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 are um, that were. In 2008, we had the work Operation Blitz. Uh, which was 10,000, uh, 10, uh, 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 500 nearly, I think, houses, which, as uh, Max has indicated to you, brings at the end 60 uh, family notices, uh, 15 or 16 houses, I can't remember. 16, 16 houses uh, uh, comes out. So that was the detailed work we did in that one, a detailed process. We did our work in relation to the housing executive, I think, did work in Lurgan, also in relation to welfare reform, 900 houses, and I think very what they found one 
one house in that process. Um, and I know, for example, that Fold uh, Housing Association mm. uh, did a, a similar exercise in mm. uh, 750 houses. No, uh, yeah, no, they didn't find any there. Um, so the point is, I think we need to do, uh, and we're doing uh, at the present time the survey the housing executive was running around for this year, 2,800 houses, the ones that haven't been in contact for over a year because of uh, no um, repairs think, process, and that is producing, it has not completed, but indications are low level. So the answer is, I'm not sure that that level is right. It'll take us some years to do it, and I think it's important that we do get some sense of the metric on this issue. But I think the key figure which indicates to us that every time a house is wrongly occupied, there's 89,000 pounds of property that's not being used for the right purpose. You know, it is a sizable issue here. So one, we need to get a size of it. We need to work out what is happening here, a better sense, right across our stock, and get a better estimate. But at this stage, I think we are too early to establish to say whether it's 1%, 2% or that process. Um, Mr Hare, the National Fraud Authority has estimated that the, that the cost of tenancy fraud to the public purse is at least £1.8 billion, yeah. five times more than the level of housing benefit fraud. So that, that makes it the largest category of fraud loss across local government in, you know, in England. Using the Audit Office Commission figures for England, the Audit Office of Paragraph 10 have projected that there could be as many as 2,500 Housing Executive Housing Association houses that are fraudulently occupied. What is your assessment of the number of social homes fraudulently occupied um, currently? Chairman, as I said, I mean, I've been, I mean that was, as I described, our work to date has shown lower levels at the moment. Um, we don't. Uh, Do you give have you a figure? This. The you figures I figure. give you a sense. I say the, 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 the survey in 2008, which gave you in the end, that gave us a figure of 16 repossessions uh, in the process. Um, a, a, a lower level of process. You've seen the abandonment levels, which we have achieved. Uh, which, which generally, it's in the report as well. We see a, a lower level here. But the point I, I, I want to emphasise at the moment is. We recognise that it's going to take some years of careful surveying in this work to get a sense of where exactly this figure lies in this process. And obviously, it's, it's, it, you see in, in GB where they uh, themselves, the Royal Authority, has seen they, they, they get some sense it's higher in that process after their first year. I think it's an area where there's going to be, there's going to be considerable uh, sort of work nationally also to get a handle on this one. So I don't think we are at the stage yet to definitely say where that level is. But the point is, we see it as a significant issue. There's a significant public resource which needs to be, we need to be sure that's being done, used correctly. There is a, by this change of focus, seeing it as just a, a housing management, a breakdown in contract relationship in most of these processes, to actually seeing it as a part of fraud and getting this focus on, we think that's a useful focus. And out of that, if we work through systematically, there is better value can be achieved from public assets. So it is not, we see it as a significant issue. We are not confident that we could put a figure yet on our sense to get at this level. Okay, thank you. Um, members, um, Deputy Chairperson? Just, just to I get this right, mm. uh, well, are you saying out of a stock of 80,000 houses or whatever, it will take you several years to find out which ones are not occupied? Um, sorry, the, the, you're asking checking the, the tenancy yes. in all processes. Um, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Max to take the process. We're doing survey work. Is I mean, uh, is uh, there's a whole process taking place here? Um, part of the action plan, for example, immediately all new tenancy will get uh, photographic evidence, uh, records of individuals that process that one. Um, but to do surveys of all 80,000 um, would. Um, uh, to immediately go and check all those process, every, every housing one. Um, the housing management process is now today, should keep us process here in this one. Regular surveys, as proposed by the, the MTSC, will give us a time to build this issue up, but to get the exact level of that one will take time. If, if this was the private sector, do you think it would take them several years mm -hmm. depending which houses they owned? We're not Sorry, it's not. It's the. It's checking the tenancy issue. It's not. I, I mean, we can check the the, the ownership as we, we 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 can we can, we check those issues out. Uh, I'm talking about landlords who have mm -hmm. tenants. Would it take them several years to check out who's on their housing? 
Do you want to quick on? Perhaps come in from the housing exec and, and let Cameron respond for the associations. Sit, sitting here today, landlords are, are core business. So, so in terms of is yours not core business? And, and, but that, that's what, what, what uh, the point I was making. Sorry, I, I wasn't clear there. Um, we, we couldn't wait about in any of this. We never have. That, that was a, a, a bit of giving yourselves the assurances of what we've always been doing. And um, we're going to be doing a, additional actions. So that's the bit of we have the estimates. From GB and specifically from England, those estimates. What we now have to test is what's the extent of the issue. But we have 88,000 houses that we must make sure every day are occupied and occupied appropriately. So, from people applying for a house through to succeeding to a tenancy, we do intensive checks as part of our day job to make sure the right person gets the right house. What we're doing through the tenancy fraud strategy, though, is really getting into some of those other actions, so some targeted auditing. We did the major blitz a few years ago. We've done 2,800 houses. We're going to be doing those targeted approaches by way of an extra check to detect fraud. But that's not a case of, if you look, for example, for our houses, 2,800 we know repairs. That's not to say no contact. So this particular blitz is just looking at those houses. Jerry will perhaps bring in to give, again, a sense from a fraud strategy of the actions that are happening, because we are, we are not and we never have been waiting um, on, on this critical and very serious issue. Yeah, I think maybe just to add, to add to that, um, in terms of the contact to try and understand who is in the properties, uh, we look to the relationship we have between our housing officers who are in regular contact with our tenants, our technical staff who are constantly visiting our, our, our units of accommodation. And if you think in terms of indirect hit would be uh, our heating servicing, we do an annual programme of servicing both our oil and gas installations, which covers about 6,000 properties every month. So we across the year would hit over 70,000 of those properties. And it's a process in place where we fail to get access to follow those up. So it's on top of that. We're targeting these properties. So the 2,800 that was referred to there, we did a, s a sample across our maintenance database and it identified 2,800 properties where there was no request for a repair in the last 12 months. Well, on average, we get about three or four repairs per property. So it gave us a suggestion that perhaps there's something not with this. Um, and in terms of following that through, we've closed out quite a significant amount of that. And to date, we've recovered a small number of properties. There's still two or 300 of those properties still to be finished out. But the results we're finding have been consistent with the big blitz we've done in 2008 and the smaller blitz we've done as part of welfare reform. That's not to say we need to continue to do that every year, and it will be a targeted programme based on analysis of the data we have and the contact we have with our properties to support our day-to-day -day work. In addition, of course, there's the whole data matching process which runs across that. We have very significant the National Fraud Initiative every two years. The uh, uh, material that we get, the six monthly reports from DWP, the matching of that process, and then there's a monthly uh, data transfer between the SSA and, and the housing executive. So we have a phenomenal amount of data matching work, which then goes into our um, uh, single investigation service and investigates houses as well. So there's a whole series of issues that is constantly looking at this issue and is driving at this question. Those extra uh, triggers, Chair, every time there's a change in anyone's benefit entitlement, mm -hmm. core benefits, that will tri trip a trigger into our housing benefit system, which usually results in a claim being suspended and into our rent system. So we'll, we'll have all of those flags coming from a number of directions to say, go, go and check. The vast majority are just changes in circumstances, but it's letting us get a handle from every different direction on tenancy occupation, um, if I can call it that. The extent of the problem, we'll, we'll quantify, refine and make sure we're, we're on top of, so as I say, audits will be yearly, but we'll keep, keep refreshing. Probably an interesting point in terms of do we have the same level of issue. Um, it's interesting in terms of looking at the, the English analysis. The problem is more predominant round about flatted houses. If you look at our profile of stock in comparison to England, England's profile of houses to flats, roughly 45 per cent are flatted compared to houses. We've got 17 per cent of our stock are flatted. The vast majority of our stock are houses. 
where I think it's, it's again it's more easy to detect and we'll have on top of we have 800 frontline staff out in the communities actively looking for these issues supporting our customers as well but we'll also have those eyes and ears that the minute there's a sense of a house not being occupied There'll, there'll be a call goes in. So quite a different profile. Scotland, for example, and you'll know from my profile, I came from Glasgow Housing. 75% of the stock there is flatted. So it, it might give a sense, but we, we need to, be, between ourselves, just review and review to get a firm handle. And I think the estimates are very helpful in focusing everyone's attention and quantify it and make sure we've got a host of actions to, to manage it properly. I think the 2% the figure is, is, is very sobering, um, and I think, as the Permanent Secretary has said, it, it gives us a, an indication of the, the potential scale of the problem. As I indicated earlier, our members have been um, intensifying their efforts to survey um, and audit their, their tenancies. And um, I think, as I, as I mentioned, in, in preparation for welfare reform, um, Fold and Clan Mill, who are two of the most uh, well-run organisations have the most robust housing management between them. They did targeted audits and surveys of around 1,250 tenants that they considered might be at, at um, risk of the bedroom tax. That didn't, uh, those, those 1,250 uh, checks did not yield a single case of, of, of tenancy fraud. I think there, there is work clearly that needs to be done to, to ensure that across across the board in Northern Ireland, we're taking a consistent approach to trying to identify and quantify the issue. Um, but I, th I think also, as, 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 as Mags Lightbody said, the fact that we do have uh, a lesser proportion of flatted stock is a, is a plus. Um, also, as far as our members are concerned, about a quarter of our members' properties are, are, are care and support schemes, so they're supported specialist sheltered housing, where you've got on-site um, presence uh, uh, every day and therefore I think the scope for tenancy fraud is perhaps less. There are some other smaller community based associations with perhaps you know one or two hundred properties where they are walking the streets uh, in a in a tightly confined geographical area every day. And again I think then in that sort of circumstance there is there is less scope for tenancy fraud. So I think I'm encouraged that our, our members' initial work suggests that Oh, that that two percent figure may be on the high side when it comes to estimating Northern Ireland's figures, but again, we're in no way complacent, and we need to do more work to to accurately establish the the baseline that we think and to to tackle it. Okay, thank you, thank you, members. Um, opening up to the line of question, I'll ask Mr. Easton. To... Thank you, Chair. Um, hi. As we are all aware, housing tenancy fraud is the use of social housing by someone who is not entitled to it. Mm -hmm. According to the Audit Office, there are six types of tenancy fraud. Mm -hmm. How many instances of tenancy fraud, according to this definition, have been detected in the last three years? Okay. Um, um, Going to par um, sorry, diagram 33, perhaps, is that the best one? Do you want to lay this one? Well, I suppose uh, it's using the definition in, mm. in, in the paper. One of the biggest areas of tenancy fraud, and I think Alex and Claudia and Cameron have touched on it, has been abandonment in Northern Ireland, which has been the highest level, and, and that's not uncommon. And that was a similar finding from the Audit Commission in relation to tenancy fraud outside, Northern, outside of um, London metropolitan areas. The housing uh, executive have recovered around 800 properties through abandonment over the last three to four year period. Uh, housing associations are something similar. On average, per year, the housing executive, or when they've collected data, which is really been from 2011 onwards, are recovering around between 200 and 250, and housing associations roughly between 100 and 120. So between the two of you, it's 1,600 have been abandoned? 800 and that's approximately 800 for housing associations? Sorry, no, it was 800 over a four year period. It's oh, right, roughly, okay. right, right, it's right, roughly right. about 300 per year. Right. Figures for abandonment have been collected by the housing executive since 2011 12. As my colleagues have indicated, a lot of the issue of tenancy fraud, particularly around abandonment, was being treated as housing management rather than fraud. So they weren't collecting the figures as a fraud total, they were collecting it as how many houses have been abandoned. 
In terms of the specifics of some of the fraud cases on the subletting issue, uh, in particular, they, they, those have been relatively minor. And I think we, the, the number of cases have been in the, the handful rather than significant numbers. It's mostly been abandoned. My understanding at the moment is th subletting. There's three cases, I think, one of which I think is with the PSNI at, at the present time. False information for housing applications. I think that the, the I think you've housing executive has presently one case with the housing uh, with, with the police on false succession and unlawful assignment. 22 cases I think are, are currently in your system providing misleading information during a right to buy application. I think you've got two cases. Two. Come up. So those are at the, that stage. That's the present level. But it, it's abandonment is the big the big theme and the big issue. See the subletting issue. Were you, were you indicating it was? To, you're not really associating that so much with fraud, but management mistakes. Yes, yeah. sir. It was abandonment. Was the the abandonment category, yeah. which is by far the largest, was what the housing executive and housing associations have been been treating as housing management, and therefore weren't um, notifying it through as fraud. Obviously, we put in, in place new processes, so that will be starting from the start of this financial year. They'll be being um, cited to the department and to the audit office as fraud cases. But up until then, they were being treated primarily as housing management, with the priority being to gain possession of the property and put it back into use. Uh, the other categories, as I said, were, were relatively minor compared to that, and, and yeah. uh, Will has given the figures for those. So, back to the abandonment, um, are you saying that there's houses that have been abandoned that you just didn't know about, but they're not fraud? Any figures? Is that what I mean, yeah. I want to, I mean, just maybe both Jerry, you mean, sort of leaving this to one big sense the whole abandonment issue. I think it's, it's, it's the Chief Executive introduced in the beginning. It's the, it's the badge that was attached to the action. Uh, our actions have always been classed as housing management in terms of serving abandonment notices under the definition of tenancy fraud. Now, those abandonments would be called tenancy fraud. So the actions that we've been taking all along, if you had to rebadge it, we class as tenancy fraud. Okay. Right, okay. So. Between 2000 and 2012, 360 abandoned properties were covered by the Housing Executive and Housing Associations. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Uh, again, on average, we are recovering um, somewhere about 150, 160 properties every year. We're serving uh, in excess twice of that in terms of abandonment notices. The process you go through, properties identified as potentially being empty, you serve the abandonment notice. In many respects, people come forward because they've been on holiday, they've been caring for a relative. So the process has been followed completely through, results in about um, 18, 20 properties per month being recovered by us, which is okay. called abandonment and under the new definition would be called tenancy fraud. Okay, so they're all going to be treated as tenancy fraud until they're proven otherwise. Okay, and then some of these these frauds of people being claiming housing benefit at the same time. Of the ones examples, we uh, the, the, we do that double check, of course, in, in the system. I mean, you've got examples here. Um, actually, in the in in the NI report, actually, we've checked the majority of those ones have not been uh, claiming housing benefits, if I understand rightly. But the, obviously, we make those checks across to make sure that. Uh, there are um, yeah. any questions, and, and obviously there is a relation. We have a process of uh, the fraud issue and housing benefits, a very significant issue in itself. Um, we have processes in place between the housing executive, who is responsible for the area, and the SSA, who obviously works in this process, to look at that issue and then make the cross connections of these issues to share information to check that all but, aspects are covered. But there obviously would be housing benefit fraud attached with some of the. Potentially, there are cases of that, that process, and then they obviously you go into. You don't know how many um, uh, of these cases we can. Um, uh, the the housing trigger. benefit trigger right. is often the trigger that, again, mm. from both eyes on the ground, housing officers out doing their business, the matching of data with benefits and housing benefits is often the trigger we get. So, if someone were to make a claim for their their main income support at one address mm. and the claiming housing benefit for us at another address, that automatically triggers to say there's something not right mm. and it will cease the claim. Then we will make the contact. If we find again that the person has been living at the other property and both occupying but claiming benefit, that would allow us to deal with the property, take it back and take action against the tenancy, but also deal with the benefit issue. So it triggers two actions. But you're not going to know if they're claiming all their benefits from the one property? 
You're not going to know if they're claiming that yeah. from we, the we, we will know that from a, a matching our data with SSE's system. So that's one of the key triggers in terms of counter fraud with benefits generally. Is as soon as you are, there's any change of circumstances or any different addresses tripping up, the IT system is set to pick that up and flag through. There is there is a question to be asked. Often the questions are innocent, but it's maybe a new tenant that hasn't switched their main <coughs> benefit address over, but it lets us ask the question. Yeah, but if they haven't changed their mail about their benefits, no matter what it is, mm -hmm. you're not going to know about it. But, no, but you see where I'm coming from, don't you? Well, if, say, you've got the house that mm -hmm. you're pretending to have under the housing executive, yeah, sure. And you're going to live with your girlfriend, and you're subletting, but all your mail and all your circumstances are still registered to that address that you are meant to have. Mm. You're not going to know if they're there or not, unless th th those things come kick in. But that's not going to happen if they don't do that. The data matching bit wouldn't. You're, you're right. Wouldn't trigger that. Mm. That would be one again that through a host of other checks we would hopefully detect. So housing officers being out any issue with rents, etc. Mm. So, but you're right that the data matching bit wouldn't catch that particular issue, so we would have to rely on other actions. Okay. Okay. In 2012-13, uh, there were 3,126 cases referred to the Housing Benefit Matching Service, and 695 fell into the potential non-residence category issue. So um, all referrals were investigated, and I think 67 cases of payment error uh, were we discovered. Uh, so, I mean, that, that, those are examples of how we're using the database. But we also obviously have, when we get information, these pers the housing executive will send uh, uh, cases to our single investigation service in the SSA, and we, you know, the further investigations will be made either through data or by other means of surveillance to try and get a handle on this issue. Yeah. I, I don't know if you can do it, but it would be interesting to know if the housing benefit fraud is being at the same time as the uh, the, the, the housing fraud, if, if we're able to get a, an amount of money, how much it's cost the housing executive on housing benefits when they shouldn't have been getting it? Because it would be interesting if we could get that breakdown, if you know what I mean. We'll try and look at that, come back to you on that one out, okay. I, mean, I, I, yeah, I think. Okay. Shall we'll, I'll move on to other questions? <laughs> okay. yeah. Do you have figures for other types of tenancy frauds? What is the extent of the problem with regards to subletting or false succession, for example? Well, as I indicated, I think false succession is 22 cases at the moment. Five I think you're uh, in five years that we're, 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 we're covering through in that one. And on, on subletting, uh, say there's two, two cases at the moment being looked at that process, and you've got examples obviously here. The subletting, interesting, it looks like in the London market, where obviously the, the rental levels are much different, and there's a whole issue between the, what the market is dictating and what social renting is much different from our northern uh, Ireland situation. It does seem to be that is producing a very strong pressure. And that's why, in fact, the focus of the English and Welsh legislation is on that issue. Um, but, um, I say, at the moment, our indications would be lower level. But I think the key point is these are issues which do need to be followed up and yeah. um, worked through. OK. How many prosecutions has there been for tenancy fraud so far? The last? To date, um, uh, there has not been uh, no, this process no, because it's been no. the large amount of the abandonment issue has been looked at very much in, in, in that Process. There's none at the moment. We, we have. Not a criminal uh, we're, we're looking at two potential cases using the mm. Fraud Act. Yeah. Again, it's a general Fraud Act. It's not specific to, yeah. to tenancy fraud. We don't have that legislation here, and it's not a criminal offence in Northern Ireland currently. But picking up on the report itself, we're taking it's two or three, Jerry. Um, in terms of processing cases, three. three three cases that we're going to take as test cases through and try the, the Fraud Act. The burden of proof is clearly then in a criminal space, and it will be down to the amount of evidence and whether um, we, we get judgment through um, criminal process for that. So three. just for me to get this right, there's never been any people taken to court for tenancy fraud because the law is not there to cover that? Yeah. Uh, is that what you're saying? Okay, well, basically, what is now defined as tenancy fraud yeah. has been classed as, for us for many years as housing abandonment. <coughs> housing abandonment is a breach of your tenancy conditions. But it's, it's not, not a criminal offence. It's a breach of your tenancy agreement. The remedy for a breach of your tenancy agreement is the recovery of the property. 
Right. We don't have to go through the court system to do that. We have a statutory process being agreed. We serve a notice. It's a 28-day notice. So we use that notice to avoid going through the courts. So all those abatements that we've been reporting every year are done through administrative procedures that avoids the court process. You only go to court process if somebody challenges that. OK. So do you think you've got the laws now in place to do it? In terms of introducing the legislation, what the legislation does now is add weight to the offence, and that this becomes a criminal offence, then the penalties that go with that are much more stringent. So they're for the focus. That yet? No, we don't have that in place yet. Maybe, uh, if I could maybe just um, add, the legislation for processing fraud is the, is the Fraud Act in Northern Ireland, which lends itself to certain types of tenancy fraud which are being pursued, subletting, false information, which are covered by the Tenancy Fraud Act. Although, as the Housing side have indicated, and the housing associations, the priority has been on abandonment, which is recovery of property. Obviously, if there was any cases of abandonment and fraud that also had a benefit fraud, that would fall into the benefit regime. The English legislation that was introduced in 2012, 2013, and came in 2014, specifically related to tenancy fraud, with a particular focus on subletting as a criminal act. And we're currently looking at that legislation through the Northern Ireland Tenancy Fraud Forum with a view to considering its applicability in Northern Ireland and the benefit of it. We're also monitoring progress in England in terms of any cases that have been taken under that Act. So we, we need to strengthen our legislation here as well and the changes that are yeah, made if, across. If, as I said, we're looking very closely at the tenancy fraud. We're looking at our own tenancy fraud form to give us some advice on it. We have analysed the legislation that was introduced in 2013 in England and also some of them in 2014. The key provisions of it, which we're looking at, are the criminal tenancy fraud from subletting, a specific category, and also some legislative provisions to enhance data sharing. So we're looking at those provisions. Um, if we think that if we want to bring it forward, we'll obviously bring it forward for consultation, and hopefully, uh, should those new legislation be introduced in Northern Ireland, we hope to take it forward as soon as possible. Is there not a fraud act in 2006? Yes. As I've said, the current legislative provisions, and I should be clear, the current legislative provisions for tackling fraud in Northern Ireland are the Fraud Act 2006. I was an executive pursuing three cases Something under that, that Fraud Act. Okay. So you're only doing three now, but since 2006 you haven't done any? Through the courts, you've been pursuing under this. No, that's that's fair to say. There haven't been a case in the fraud yeah. act. Right. Is that, is that, could, could is I just not a bit poor? Could I just say that within the, I think having worked in in, in social housing in England uh, until a couple of years ago, I think until there was specific legislation in England criminalising social tenancy fraud and making clear um, what that covered. Uh, English local authorities and social landlords would not would not have been bringing very many cases of t tenancy fraud through the Fraud Act at all, um, for the reasons that we've already outlined. So, I mean, I think I think with uh, I think um, looking at the the impact of the new legislation in England, um, whether it's having an effect and how it dovetails with our legislative position, I think is really worthwhile um, because I think it it, it might uh, help to. Um, it might act as a strong, stronger deterrent against tenancy fraud, um, and I think perhaps some of the, the provisions, perhaps around data sharing, might help social landlords to to get quicker and better access to the data they need to to prove cases. Okay. Just, just in terms of the, the housing executive, in that point, no, knew that the Fraud Act existed again, not tenancy fraud, but the Fraud Act 2006, which has coverage in Northern Ireland. We've been using a agreement, a legal agreement with our tenants as the quickest and most effective means to get properties back and also to tackle any other issues, people applying for a house that have given false information. So always our drive has been to get the house back by the quickest route. We took legal advice on the use of the Fraud Act, just following again the patterns in Great Britain and, and some of the legal advice was and, and looking at English application. You're then into court process, our experienced court process team get a decision to proceed can take 18 months. Um, but we've been happy just now with three cases that we think we've been able to build intensively and it's taken a long while, a strong bank of evidence to um, approach pre-service and the, the prosecution service to say we believe that these are criminal acts. But most of our actions have been successful using the activity just now. I think in terms of the department's position, unlike England and Wales, do we need our own dedicated tenancy fraud act 
is a matter for we really quantify the issue. And then for landlords like ourselves, would that give us a quicker route to get houses back? So wh why, why are you using for those three examples uh, uh, the Act now and, and not the tenancy agreement? Why, why have you chosen to go down this route now with these well, three? It's one of them. Is that because out. of the spotlight? Yeah. So, I mean, is it because of the spotlight programme? Or? Well, it actually comes from the Old Office yeah. report. I mean, the Old Office, yeah. uh, uh, rightly enough, we, 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 we welcome it very much. I mean, there has been a shift in thinking right across British Isles in this thinking about how you handle this issue. And I say we have gone very much with that, 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 that shift. And as the Old Office said, we want to see there are aspects and powers within the 2006 Act which need best tested and developed and, and used. It is not. We don't necessarily need to wait for additional new legislation. So we have been very encouraged by the fact that the Housing Executive has, is trying to make sure we get some of those cases, see whether we can test that, and therefore from that experience see whether you use some of the existing laws, as well as this debate which we have to have. What is, uh, it, it, are new powers necessary? Um, it's particularly in the subletting area, say that the powers have been taken in GB, and we want to know whether it's, it's, I mean, how big an issue is that in Northern Ireland, and how are the best to deal with I think maybe as well it's worth reflecting on the odd office report, which we would agree with that the vast majority of tenancy fraud will be detected and addressed through the actions that they have advised, the, the various positive housing management issues, but that there is also a legislative route for certain types of fraud, and it lends itself. The Fraud Act lends itself to certain types of fraud which are being tested to false information. The new Tenancy Fraud Act in England will lend itself to certain types of fraud as well, such as um, subletting, but also subletting for a profit. But the vast majority of uh, tenancy fraud, as described in the old office that we are finding, is abandonment, neither of which those legislative provisions are there to deal with. And really, our legislation in Northern Ireland, with the serving of um, notices of possession, is quite far advanced and is a, and is a good route for dealing with abandonment, which is our, our primary issue. So uh, the other area, the other frauds are quite specific. We're testing some for the Fraud Act as it exists, and we're looking at the provisions in the Tenancy Fraud Act in England. Okay, thank you, Chair. Okay, and Mr. Hazard, you wanted in there. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Just on the back of some of Alex's question, and Tim, you, you mentioned there about looking towards you know the development of legislation in England mm -hmm. over the last couple of years, especially in regard to subletting. One of the things that was revealed in the Spotlight Programme was the similar issue regarding organised crime. It was loyalist paramilitary that was shown to be involved in similar practice. In England, is there the same focus on organised crime syndicates and the, the use of subletting as well? Or well, I mean, it's it's. Uh, but it's not there, they, there, it's mentioned in obviously some of the audit commission fraud reports about the potential for there to be organized crime and, and a profitable area where they've really dealt with that particular issue in their new legislation is subletting for a profit and the proceeds of that so that is one very specific area in the, in the tenancy fraud legislation England that we will be looking at um, I think maybe Jerry might be better placed to make some comments specifically about some of the um, allegations in, in well, I can't go into the detail, obviously, because one of the cases we are talking about yeah. is the case where someone has been subletting and there is the potential for a criminal offence. So I can't really talk more about it, but it's one of the cases. And that's a case got where there is potential criminal offence is we're having a formal piece of legislation which could result in a criminal conviction with that weight to some of the things that we're trying to do here. Thanks. To your sense. OK, thank you. Um, Mr Hussey, your questions, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, I've listened to you quite a a little information here and you can get the information overload. You can also get some of the answers here that you're not actually getting them. Um, how big do you think an issue this actually is, housing fraud? How big an issue? How many houses do you think possibly be uh, fraudulently used? Well, as I said, the, the figure is 2%, which is 2,500 comes out, is, is one which is taken from, national, from a survey, a London, uh, extrapolated from a London survey in this year in this one. And uh, the answer I'm saying is uh, the figures we've had from the Northern Ireland surveys would indicate a lower level than that. Um, but I believe it's too early for us to say exactly where it is in, in that process. That's, I'm afraid, is, that's what, from the, the material we have had to date, we'd just say, we uh, had three surveys that keep on by with lower levels when you're checking all those the, those tendencies. I suppose I mean, probably uh, there's maybe three areas to triangulate it from. You've got the audit commission estimate of two percent, which takes you to two and a half thousand. You have the annual recovery yeah. of abandoned properties, which sits around three hundred to three hundred and fifty. Yeah. And then you've got the specific blitz campaigns, which are coming in around point 
coming in by 0.1%. So you've gone from 2% to 0.3 to 0.4% to 0.1%. And obviously, I think it's a case of ongoing work to determine the correct level. I mean, I can understand fold housing not having an issue with this because mm -hmm. clearly that is clearly supervised and regularly supervised. Now, again, going back to some of the figures that have been mentioned here, uh, is it 6,000 properties a month that have a visit of some sort in relation to uh, oil and coal and whatever? So that's 72,000 houses a year. We have housing officers, 800 frontline staff. But what are these frontline staff? Are these housing officers, or is this in the local offices? What are the 800 frontline staff? Uh, those 800 would be a combination of our housing officers, uh, our maintenance officers, also our plan maintenance technical officers who would be employed to do work in terms of big plan schemes. So they're all those people who would have a regular contact with the stock. Right. Uh, I mean, here we have a. A situation where, in most cases, you're relying on, on fraudulent activity being reported by members of the public, and it does seem to me that we could be more proactive in this. And the fact that you have 800 frontline staff, why can we not sort of see a very quick tenancy audit? Why, why can't we see something like that quicker than you're talking several years? Why would it take several years when you have 800 staff who are virtually there? You have 6,000 houses. A month that are being visited. Uh, why are all these pieces not being brought together so that on one go we can nearly have this done in one year? I think in responding to that point from the housing executive, we're not we're not waiting years to see if if, if our houses are occupied. We have firm evidence of them being occupied through we're out in the houses, we're over the door, mm. we're in the communities, and tenants are in contact with mm. us regularly. So that particular decision this year, the blitz we did was in customers that haven't had a repair in a year. But checking our systems, they'll be on the phone, they'll be in our offices, we'll be over the doorstep with them. So we've got a firm handle today on our properties being occupied. But the, the approach we're seeing with these blitzes is we're just going to keep picking different areas each year to get to houses that all of the activity, so we're out in serious numbers in the communities, and we hear from the community, but we don't rely on that. We've got lots of, of we are the landlord, we, we are there every single day. But anyone who hasn't been in touch, we're taking that just as a be an issue that customer service go out and see if, if our tenants are okay. But using that again to say, let's make sure that the property is properly occupied by the right person, but we're not and, and never would consider waiting years to see if, if our houses are occupied. Customers I'm, 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 I'm not suggesting for a moment that you're waiting years for this to happen, but what I'm saying here is I, I don't believe you have a firm handle on this because clearly certain people won't contact you because they're going to do the, the work themselves. In some instances, it takes that long for the housing executive to call rent. They won't do it themselves, and they'll maintain their own properties. And some people are very proud of their homes, and they'll carry on doing that. Mm. But here we have a situation uh, where there is a possibility of housing fraud, and that just doesn't affect the executive. It affects our constituents because we have people coming into us on a regular basis looking for homes, and it's a home they want. Never mind housing executive; it's a home that they want. Exactly. Uh, and as I say, I. I feel that a lot more can be done if you have 800 frontline staff who are regularly out in the community, and particularly in, in small east towns like Oma. I, I mean, I know that uh, we, we had this discussion when I sat in the DFP committee when Oma District Council sent their staff out to find out what houses were unoccupied for the written issue. You know, that was done very quickly. Yeah, maybe we just add the fact that because we have such a regular contact with the staff, um, the reason why we went back and did the repairs analysis was we generated over 400,000 repair requests a year. So on average, there's about four or five repairs per property. So you would expect some contact from the tenant. We targeted those 2,800 properties because there were absolutely no repair requests, and that might well have been because some people were very proud; they want to do their own thing, they don't want to be disturbed. We just felt it was a potential indicator for people maybe not living in those homes. We're almost complete in terms of that exercise, and of the 2,600 that we've closed out our analysis, we've recovered five of those properties. Now, one of those five properties happened to be an elderly person now in a nursing home, as a result of which her family have now given up the keys of the property. Under the definition of tenancy fraud, that lady would be committing tenancy fraud. 
she wasn't occupying the home that was her home. Of the remaining properties, but, but we but have surely had, in those cases, I mean, where, where somebody is out or in hospital, they can't hold their tenancy for up to a year. Yeah. Absolutely. We weren't notified of the property at all intents and purposes as far as we were concerned it was empty. And if people have an intention to return home, they can keep their property. This lady has decided to give up her tenancy. But in that exercise, while we haven't completely finished it, we have currently 83 live abandonment notices where, to all intents and purposes, we don't have sufficient evidence that people are occupying the homes. But we've got to follow due process in terms of serving that 28-day notice. Those 83 could give up 83 tenancies. They could give up 10 tenancies. We'll know within the next four weeks the outworkings of that 2800. What we will do with that is to sit back, analyse what we found out of that exercise. Can we build on that for next year? Is there something we can add to that in the middle of the year? Can we have a different approach so that we try to focus our efforts on top of the day-to-day -day work and the regular contact that we have with our properties? The major issue that you obviously face when people are homeless and a homeless situation are that obviously bank accounts are difficult, you don't have a permanent address, uh, children who are living with their parents find it difficult because clearly they may be in this house today or that house tomorrow until they get permanent housing and, and clearly that is a major, major issue. You, you made reference here earlier to people uh, applying for housing and having to produce various documents and that is the way you are doing it now and clearly if you have not been living in a, a fixed residence you are not going to have that sort of information. Uh, the taking the photograph of somebody, I, I really don't see how that's going to be that big a deal. You know, uh, people change over years. Once I was thin, look at me today. Uh, but I accept the idea of, of passport, driving license, or whatever. But those things are difficult to obtain if you haven't got an address to which they should be sent. Uh, temporary accommodation. It's my understanding from 2008 to 2012. £40 million was spent in providing temporary accommodation, and half of that was funded through housing benefit. Again, should alarm bells not have been ringing when year on year the amount continued to rise to the level whereby in 2012 almost £10.5 million was spent on temporary accommodation? Does that, you know, does that not cause major concern within the executive? Um, homelessness in a recent report published on the, the increase in homelessness, and, and that's our, as well as being the landlord, that's our statutory function, is to make sure anyone in those um, dreadful circumstances are supported through, get accommodation and get settled accommodation where that's suitable. Some of the, the customers presenting is homelessness, temporary accommodation will be an option that they'll need for a while, where they perhaps need lots of support before they're settled to permanent accommodation, if that ever happens. Seeing the numbers going up, yeah, absolutely for us, it's making sure every property of ours is occupied to create those opportunities. Every property of the housing association sector is occupied as an interest. And we've also been looking at private sector options to make sure we can get people settled to accommodation options, looking at the new build programme, etc., and, and maximising that. So seeing the numbers going up, I think, is, is a trend that we're in and amongst. We've been part of the, the uh, analysis and review. We're actually, in terms of the housing executives' uh, board strategy and working with DSD, refreshing how we deal with that to try and prevent and um, be more creative in how we deal with homelessness. We arrange a housing options, but also that I think a big key in it is making sure there's enough properties available where people are presenting. But where we are is trying to dig under how we present. Customers coming in at our doors saying, I'm homelessness, um, are, are just now kind of down a statutory route to be assessed, get their entitlement. If you look at some of the experience in GB, it's starting to look at more housing options when you come in the door. Um, if you're able to settle straight to permanent accommodation, then get the landlord in up front and centre in those discussions. And then people who do need more support and help, that's where I think temporary accommodation supporting people's services come in. So we are live to that issue, but you're right, it brings it to life when we wear both hats. We look after the homelessness responsibilities, so we must make sure there's adequate supply, and that both internally and for the associations, every house is used. One of the points you did make there, again, three quarters of the cost of temporary accommodation was spent on private rentals, <coughs> and I'm sure you know, the landlords would have thought that was a great idea. Uh, how much was this monitored by the department? You know, was there any monitoring at all, and what measures were sort of used to try and sort of uh, 
address this because clearly three quarters, ten point five million pounds, nearly eight million pounds of ten and a half million pounds. I suppose maybe just to, to put the homelessness issues in, in context in the departments very aware of the issue of homelessness and we have a, a robust homelessness strategy in place. Homelessness figures over the last five years have been, have been relatively constant and the causes for homelessness and people presenting with homelessness have been relatively constant as well. Each year the housing site will have about twenty thousand people presenting as homeless and between nine and nine and a half thousand will be accepted as homeless. The reasons for those nine thousand have been really the same, which is primarily sharing breakdown. 30% accommodation not reasonable, 17% or potential loss of private rent accommodation, about 14%, and other reasons making up the rest. Um, it's the responsibility of the housing executive to, to assist those 9,500 to 10,000 people find homes. And really what we've seen is a shift, and perhaps Chair, we talk a little bit more about this, but uh, and Mag's touched on it, how, how, do you, how do you meet that need, that urgent need? And we have seen an increasing rise in the private rented sector as an option of meeting that need, and that's been categorised at the same time by a, a decline, relatively speaking, in hostel accommodation, as individuals prefer to be housed in the private rented sector, and indeed bed and breakfast accommodation. So I think the issue of homelessness has been fairly constant. There is a homelessness strategy in place to try and reduce homelessness, uh, and our strategy is that you try and deal with homelessness before someone becomes homeless, so that they don't actually present, and that was some of the housing options. In terms of use of the private rented sector, I mean, I think, uh, and the housing executive will, will mention this, and Jerry might talk about it. It's becoming a sector that does provide accommodation, both in terms of homelessness, but across Northern Ireland, it accounts now for about 130,000 households are, are housed in the private rented sector. I'm going to go slightly off track here, to share if you don't mind. I mean, clearly, uh, accommodation not reasonable. Some of these private places do become beyond a joke. People don't want to live in hostels. People want a home. I'm going back to the point that I made at the very start. People want a home. Uh, the bedroom tax issue was one that caused major consternation because even the housing executive, I don't think you've got that many one-bedroom flats. You accommodate people basically in two-bedroom flats. It would be the sort of minimum, mm -hmm. and that is the case in the private sector as well. So people will have to be housed in a two-bedroom uh, flat or apartment or whatever. And in some instances, they're going to have to sublet to a second person to actually be able to afford it, yeah. because the housing benefit will be based on one person. Mm -hmm. The fact that you have two rooms is neither here nor there. But there uh, one of the issues, for example, I mean, obviously the, the whole issue of um, uh, uh, the welfare reform issue and any decision made on that issue, and one that has been active discussion about the whole question of bedroom issues and that, and um, how that would be resolved here. So I'm not talking about it. It has to be said, I mean, subletting is it's acceptable within, in the system. The key point is the, process, it, the question is when people are doing it for profit or not doing it in an appropriate way in the process we do. And of, actually, I know in, in England, actually, one of the issues it, it, subletting, organised subletting is, is actually mm. a key part of the process that they're going on where they have the bedroom tax to resolve some of these issues. I think it does all this emphasise the need for uh, the broader issue of very strong housing management of the social housing stock and, and the ability to have the information and the options in front of tenants to make sure they get the solutions they need. I'm going to come to the end now, Chair. You'll be glad to hear near the end of me. Uh, we, we looked at a lot of things here. You know, recovery has increased in England, and that is as a result of being sort of proactive mm. to address the issue. I feel that the yourselves believe that this figure is probably not as high as has been suggested by the audit office mm. and even if it were only one percent it still is quite a number of houses so what are you doing to be proactive here because uh, as i say you, you've mentioned and i mentioned it earlier you were going to uh, I think it was mentioned several years of surveying uh, and all the bits and pieces. But what are you going to do to proactively to try and get this done as quickly as yeah. possible? Because to me, yeah. this is an issue that has to be done quickly, and then we can move and try and rehouse people who do need housing and do need a home. And it's the home is the important yeah. issue here, Chair. Chairman, let me start off. But then I mean, the key point I'd make is this: we, 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 we touched on some of the survey work, but the key point: all the actions that are put down as good practice in this report are the very actions that the housing executive are going through at the moment and doing this process. That's the whole question. We're looking at the whole question, I mean, the question of, of do you have already uh, up, uh, uh, there's not a dedicated, at the moment we haven't decided on a tenancy, dedicated tenancy fraud hotline, but there is, telephone, it's up right up there in the housing executive 
phone, 24-hour phone line for people to report this issue to try and get the public issues there. We have already the specialist neighbourhood and officers in place. We've got uh, at least 60 of those people there. We're doing the tar tar targeted uh, tenancy audits, which the NIO and uh, uh, the I'll experience it. We're doing the, 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 that work. We are looking at the question of specialist tenants, a uh, fraud team. There's already, in fact, five staff in the housing sector looking at that issue. We're trying to see whether we broaden that issue out um, to connect the housing associations issue. Now, we're looking at that issue. We're doing all the data sharing processes here. We're doing the publicity raising of the issue. So everything that has been done in the GB to actually push this issue up here and make it public. Mm. We are on, you know, the housing executive and the housing associations are on the case. Mm. So it's to say, I was just talking about your out because the questions start off about the question of the size mm. issue. We are trying to get a handle on that because I think it is actually important we get a handle on what we really believe is the figure so that we can drive that issue. But we actually are doing all the actions that are being recommended in GB. And you talked about the recovery levels in GB. Northern Ireland is above the recovery levels in the GB regions. Um, I mean, the figures, I think, uh, yeah. which we saw, yeah, the actual recovery that. levels, yeah. we are already achieving above that. We believe we can go even higher. Mm. And actually, in our band of legislation, we've got some legislation which is better than we think than the GB. Yeah. It's much quicker in that process. So, mm. you no, know, we're far from complacent, because, mm. as you say, it's about getting people into homes. But actually, we, there's a lot of things there that actually we are on the case on. The, the main issue that I want to see resolved clearly is fraud. Somebody that is keeping a home from somebody else mm -hmm. is, is worse than anything else. The fact that somebody is keeping a house that they could house a family, yeah. Yeah. that is the main thing. That, that is my main concern. Uh, people is my concern. The, the pounds, pennies and pence, that's to yourselves. You can sort that out mm. with, with whoever. Yeah. It's people that we're worried about. Yeah. Chair, unfortunately, I have to leave you now, and I hope uh, that there are, our guests don't think it's because of something they said or didn't say. <laughs> <laughs> no bother. Thank you, Mr. Hussey. Okay. Michael, Mr. Copeland. Um, uh, thanks, Chair. Um, <laughs> well, if I may be familiar, mm. um, I don't share your optimism about the levels of, of fraud, and uh, I think many of us who have been out knocking doors, particularly in Belfast or in urban areas this past couple of days, would be aghast the number of properties that appear to be unoccupied mm -hmm. uh, and yet to uh, also appear on the electoral register. It's frightening to be quite honest mm -hmm. with you. Uh, it does confuse me. Saying there, there are two issues here. There is the Public Accounts Committee, which is the money, and then there is the stock management mm -hmm. of the housing executive. And since this is the Public Accounts Committee, it's the money aspect of time as much interested in on anything else. And the property can be lawfully occupied yeah, and yet right. still have a degree of housing benefit yeah. fraud going on in it, where there's mm. someone in the house who shouldn't mm. be there, or where the person who's in the house who shouldn't be there has yeah. another property somewhere else. Um, and it staggers me having spent or something about it almost 10 years dealing with housing, and Mags probably hasn't had the benefit of my emails as yet, but her predecessor used to get them at 3 o'clock on a Sunday morning, and in fairness to him, I'm back pretty quickly. And it's not that I like torturing people, but the cry for people, not their house, but as Ross said, to have homes, mm, really is nice overwhelming. And yet we have this really mishmash, with due respect to all the components of the mishmash, We've got social housing provided through the housing executive. We've got social housing provided through housing associations, both of which do a slightly different but equally commendable job within social housing. And then we've got a whole morass of privately rented landlords, some of whom are good, and some of whom are atrocious. And any investigation into fraud concerning housing benefit particularly would be better swinging a... Uh, a long term and a short term lump in, in that direction. No, 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 that, that's neither here nor there. Well, um, uh, my, my first question um, after that statement um, was for yourself. And, uh, I'd just like to know how you can convince us that your department and the Housing Executive Associations view tenancy fraud as a high priority because it's been around for a very long time. And then with a spotlight programme, and then you went back to 2009. The, the history of this and the potential for fraud. Back an awful long way further than that. Mm -hmm. 
And what reassurance could you give, give us that you, as a department, and, and perhaps Mags, uh, without going over mm -hmm. uh, the old same ground again, what steps have you taken to ensure that it is not only regarded as a high priority but treated as a high priority? Because the two are different. Okay, I, I mean, I, I say. We recognise that there has been a shift in thinking from what was good housing management issue, and which was dealing with it in that way, because the contractual issue, we, there's a shift in thinking in towards tenancy fraud. We have taken, uh, so we've got the, uh, the Northern Tenancy Fraud Forum set up and the sharing information around that process and, and, and getting, therefore, the information from the housing executive, the lodging cases, the, the focus on that area. At the same time, I mean, uh, I've got uh, a team within the, my housing division, which has a regular meeting with the housing executive about the whole issue of fraud issue in that process, regular process in that one. That is linked in the system. I have a subcommittee of my departmental board, which focuses on fraud. You know very well, we've discussed it previous times, I mean, the fraud issue is a very major issue for us on the whole benefit fraud issue. It's a very major exercise for the, the entire department. We've got very specialised teams that process. Fraud is dwarfed by error, both by customers and the department. We, yes, and you also know how we're driving both those down and very significantly process. And one thing on housing benefit fraud, for example, uh, we have issues there where we have considerable concern on that issue. We're working with the housing executive, with our specialists in that process. We've set them targets for reduction in housing benefit fraud, how we get that process. And as you know, welfare reform changes that. You could, we can bring those things. We'll be bringing, combining those things together in the process uh, as well. So somehow we're going to have to find a different solution in the process. I'm just saying that is a very clear process. So there is a whole series of process here that is very strong, and we've got a very strong focus departmentally on fraud issue. And now that, like everyone else, we are seeing this aspect of abandonment and other process as very core to our fraud, it has come into our fraud structures and that's where we drive forward and I say the result it has the resources are there and the focus is in there in that process. But it's early days. I mean as I say, but the move that took place in G B was paralleled by a move the move in Northern Ireland because and the housing sector as I say were very proactive in leading that. And I think that's the sign that we do take it seriously, very seriously in the process, because it goes back to we share your commitment and the issue. It's about actually making sure that these Houses are used for the purposes that are needed. Want a comment? Yeah, um, for, for a committee, I won't bore you again with the, the, the no, year, it years of, well, it wasn't of, boring, of, <laughs> of action we've been through. Um, we, we, we're keeping refreshing the CR action plan. We're going to review. We've got additions already to add to it. We've been working with the, the National Fraud Forum, who ha have fairly commended the work to date, um, checking everything we've done to say you're missing anything. Their sense is you, you, you're pretty much doing everything that we would recommend in terms of, of good practice. The best practice focuses on kind of strategies that deal with prevention, because that's always the better bit. So building cultural awareness with staff and our customers about the impacts of tenancy fraud and the consequences for folks that, that, that commit it. The next strand after prevention is detection. So we've again been bolstering our issues there and how we get more staff out in the communities, making sure we're live to those issues, data matching, how we can gather from modern technologies, all of the, the triggers that tell you if there's something to go and look at. You'll see from our evidence that so the vast cases are genuine and innocent, but we are finding the perpetrators um, of tenancy fraud and then take our action. The bit that we want to keep focusing on, though, is the last strand, once you find it, the response. So huge successes in terms of using the tenancy, using the breach of the tenancy, be that non-occupation, to get people to hand back the keys and let us get that into occupation as quickly as we can with least costs involved. Where we find those cases, though, that we have our suspicions and there's denial, really be intensive. One particular case that has been on our radar and come through whistleblowing um, from our, our colleagues in the fraud office over six months alone, 30 visits by our front line teams to try and detect and build enough evidence. And those are the ones, again, can we build enough to use the Fraud Act? because that, that's a penalty to really get some cases to highlight publicly. 
that, that um, we're willing to even use criminal legislation to deal with these, as well as the tenancy bit. So we'll, we'll keep on that, but hopefully giving a, a, enough of a sense of how important it is to us, wearing both a homelessness hat and a landlord hat. Um, I'm sure yeah, Cameron yeah. will want to, to come in as well. And I, I suppose as, a, a, as a, a recognition that we have been taking this seriously, I think I would point again to the, to the recovery levels that we have over the last four years, which, as colleagues have already pointed out, are um, better than those in, in GB. And I think that demonstrates that we've been taking that issue around abandonment very seriously and, and have been effectively dealing with it, although we, we do want to do more. And I think as a result of this um, report, we are refocusing, reframing efforts and re-intensifying efforts um, to support uh, tenants at every stage. Um, for example, at tenancy sign-up stage, pre-tenancy classes, so uh, tenants know their rights and responsibilities, raising the awareness of fraud, encouraging people to report it, knowing, uh, telling them how they should report it. Um, both the housing executive and ourselves are doing early tenancy visits in the first six to eight weeks. Increasingly, we'll be doing those unannounced, following the, the, the evidence and the, the recommendation in the report. But more, sh more of those should be unannounced to help help detect fraud. Like the, like the housing executive, our members are doing target, uh, you know, estate visits on a monthly basis. We're, we're also, for example, Apex are recruiting. Um, active tenants, so that in each estate there is someone they can go to um, who has a particular knowledge, and, and do, walking the estate with with those active tenants to identify anything suspicious, any properties that seem not to be occupied, making it easier through a range of means for um, for people to to report the problem, um, including through modern media and the, the the tenancy audits and surveys, for example. Um, Apex, having having done it on a, a three-year rolling basis, they're now doing they're now going to be doing 100% of tenants audited every year, partly to, to deal with this. Um, and so I think there, there is definitely more that we can do. Where um, you know Clan Mill, for example, are using technology more more smartly. Uh, Mags mentioned key fobs. Clan Mill Housing are already have that key fob technology in quite a number of their schemes and are using that those key fob. Um, data records as well as CCTV evidence to establish exactly who and who isn't using a property in a in a in a flatted block. Um, the, the 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 work around photo ID and making that systematic uh, associations, along with the housing executive, are beginning to use you know ensure they have photographic ID at sign up. Um, but there 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 are there is areas where we can we can do more. For example, around the information sharing protocol. But I think. Hopefully that gives you a flavour that actually between the housing executive and housing associations, social landlords here are in the case. We're taking this seriously. We recognise we can do more, and we're working together to to, to improve further. Just on that, I know uh, two indications here for brief supplementaries. Mr. Gervin and the deputy chairperson. Yeah. Very brief. Just 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 on that very point, and I appreciate that. Uh, yes, we're hearing what you are doing and what what you're intending to do. But we look back at 2011-12, where the three, where 363 properties were actually brought back in by process. Um, 363 properties. There obviously must be some areas which are performing very well because there were a number of areas, and it's, it's in it's in the document, and it's figure six on page 18. Uh, or maybe I'm wrong. No, it was appendix two. But there are. A number of offices that not one, not one property was detected at, and I'm thinking of Bambridge, Bury, Arma, Antrim, and I find, and that's one of the I represent Antrim area uh, and Limavady. Now, is there a reason for that? Is there a possibility yeah. that those offices have taken the eye of the ball that they have other priorities, or are those areas? Um, Occupied by very law-abiding citizens, or is it the complete opposite that there is a fear to act upon it because of potentially what ramifications you might get if you do knock the doors? I am wanting an honest answer in relation to that matter because I do know that staff sometimes don't go to certain areas because of what potentially can happen. I um, will bring Jerry in on some of the detail, but to drive that consistency, that, that was a big thread of our training for all of our staff. Mm. 
to raise awareness to Tensey Fraud. Part, part of a housing officer's training, though, is doing those regular visits and what to do when you suspect <coughs> a property is empty or not occupied by the right person. Processed it to flow, flow, flow through. You're right, though, in terms of using the, these kind of indicators of other trends of good practice, bad practice, something happening. That's what Jerry and his team have been looking at. But we, we chose to do uh, training and use the National Fraud Forum specifically on that, so all frontline staff were trained on how to deal with it, how to see it, and how to action it. And then create an easy process within the organisation to get consistency of how it's recorded. I'll bring Jerry in on some of the specifics. Though. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a valid point, and, and some of the things we would look to in terms of trying to triangulate where we'd focus our energies is if an office is in a given period of time don't report any. It could be a mixture of those things. It could be because the stock is all occupied. It could be because the men have no flats. It could be because they're inconsistent in terms of how they approach this. So as a result, of we've reinvested and retrained on everybody. There's a consistent way of reporting this. There's a consistent way of recording it. We've set up a system now to manage the data, which will help us take that broader overview. Uh, and you can see in recent years that there's a spread of reporting right across our offices. Uh, we would continue to monitor all that information with a view to helping us focus particular exercises on an annual basis to supplement the day-to-day -day work, because um, there is a view across the piece that no matter what the stock is, there is a good chance that some of those stock may not be occupied. So reports whereby an individual office reports absolutely none could be right. The trigger for us would be is just to follow up on that and check that. We further audit work ourselves by doing maybe a mini blitz on a particular estate. Uh, and I was interested in the comments were made early, particularly by those of you who have been doing electioneer recently, in terms of the number of properties you have come across that particularly would be, em be empty. I would be keen to follow up that with any individual member who have mm. any particular address, and I'm sure you didn't record all the individual address when we were about, you had enough to do. But those sorts of things can add to the sorts of things we are doing day and daily with the public reps who are out there who find these things, and they may be genuine, but it does no harm for us to follow up on them. So. Yeah, I was interested in how it's certainly going to in it, because they, you remember in the Spotlight programme, there was a hundred, uh, they came from one of these 133 houses were found mm. empty by, I think it was budget energy. So obviously we check those issues out, uh, and I understand of that issue, 36 were housing executive yeah. houses, and I think you've now there, there are two that you think are abandoned. I mean, yeah. all this, 13 were housing executive houses, uh, association houses, and they're, they're, you've checked all yeah, the tenancies are fine. Checked, right? The rest, therefore, are private sector one the process, and so often, and of course, as you know, many of our housing executive estates are no longer. I mean. Uh, the housing executive owned ones may even be a minority in the news estates. There's a lot of private houses. So, but to say, it didn't say in that one example, we, d we have checked up this issue, and I say we come to two abandoned houses from the, from the social sector from looking at that process. Well, what, what I, and I'm, I appreciate that we're dealing with tenancy fraud here yeah, as opposed to possibility that some of those are benefit fraud. Mm -hmm. issues in mm -hmm. relation to housing benefit mm -hmm. being claimed by private landlords, not necessarily. Yes, they might well have a no tenant. They might well have a tenant who is in receipt of housing benefit, mm -hmm. but not necessarily living there. And that's another. That's another yeah. very, very serious thing. But that's that's a that's a fight for another day. Mm -hmm. But it's still public money. And at the end of the day, I'm just I'm just coming in on the inconsistencies between area yeah. Yeah. on one area and yeah. another. You go five miles down the road to Newton Abbey. Yeah. Newton Abbey two. And Newton Abbey one, you'll find very similar in relation to the numbers of properties that are done. Yeah. You go five miles up the road to Antrim and you find none. No. It just doesn't doesn't matter. I, I, I think I think some of the variation in the numbers will clearly be down to variation in practice. And we we will we'll be working with we'll be working with colleagues uh, in the DSD, the housing executive and NIAO to make sure that the, the highest standards of practice are, 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 are rolled out across Northern Ireland. But I think it's, it's, it's to be expected that there will be big variations according to whether the area is high, high demand, low demand, whether it's urban or rural, whether some of the stock is specialist or supported. Um, so, yes, I think, it, I think it will be a combination of vari some variation in practice, but also the, the big variations in the type of stock and the, where that stock is. Okay, Deputy Chairperson. Chairperson, just brief, brief intervention. Uh, Mr. Watt, you certainly create the impression you've been extremely proactive in this whole thing. How many uh, housing associations are in your federation? There's 33 listed. At the, at the moment, there's around 20. We've got about 25 registered housing associations. The number of housing associations is 
is dropping all the time because uh, they're consolidating. So a, a lot of the smaller care and support providers and um, community-based associations are currently merging with other associations. So at the moment, it's about 25 registered housing associations. Uh, you mentioned in particular a couple of housing associations as I assume exemplar material. Apex recovered four houses in 2009-2010. Yeah. You also mentioned Clan Mill recovered two, but 14 of your housing associations in the same year recovered none, mm -hmm. and indeed in the next year mm -hmm. recovered yeah. none. Yes. And in the third year, when they were amalgamated, 10 recovered none. That's not exactly a good performance, is it? A high, a high number of those are specialist care and support providers, so if you look at the list, um, the likes of Abbeyfield, Wesley, Craig Owen, and others, they, those are specialist care and support providers where, where there's on-site provision, you know, there's a, an on-site presence uh, in sheltered and specialist and supported housing schemes. So I would be astonished if some of those reported any tenancy frauds. It would be a big failure of the association if there were any cases. Um, and others, for example, um, you know, the likes of um, perhaps uh, St Matthews and Short Strand, They've got about 180, 188 properties in a very tightly defined so geographical Al area. Alpha has got 3,402 properties. Yes, and Alpha managed to recover four. Uh, uh, they weren't all sheltered. Were sorry, they? sorry, are you talking about Clan Miller or Alpha? Or? Um, Alpha. Alpha again is all sheltered housing. So again, sorry, I would uh, be astonished. Although the Apex, Apex, the Apex, 3,400. Mm. Yeah, they've got, they've got, yes, I mean, I think overall... Um, that was the one you held up as an example. Well, uh, yeah, I think Apex are, are doing, are, are, have got very good, robust housing management in place. I think they've got a very good tenancy strategy, and I'd be happy to share that with you. They're doing these estate visits. I, I, I suppose I would point overall to the, the, level, the level of recoveries um, has been pretty consistent. And again, it's, it's difficult to get a baseline, but Sorry, the, 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 yeah. the baseline from GB would suggest that this is overall from our movement, you know, the, the 0.4% is, 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 is a pretty solid record. Let's take the Northern Ireland Housing Executive as the baseline. You're not even in the running. No, the, the, um, the, level, the level of recoveries but for the housing executive and associations is comparable. Not in my book. I don't know which figures you are looking one's, at. One's 0 0.3 of a percent for the housing executive, and it's 0.4 percent of total stock for the housing okay. association. So they're yeah. okay. I'll probably similar. Come back later. Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks, colleague. Um, well, again, uh, I think it was paragraphs 34, 38 of the audit office report indicated mm -hmm. that um, the housing association actually had no tenancy fraud strategy, and the housing executive only got one. I think April 2013 it was written off. Yeah. Um, would you agree with me that having a strategy is only amounts to having a bit of paper unless you actually implement it and do something with it? And could you give us some indication as to the time scales for the, the strategy for both the sectors? No, I mean, absolutely, a piece of paper. It, it, it's, it's what you do with it in the process here. You have the action plan already, you've got the, uh, you've got the, the process up here. The actions are already. Uh, being rolled in place in that way, and I say the action plans we put in in Northern Ireland were very much, you know, in the same time scale as what has what has happened in GB. And so it's being okay. implemented as we speak. Absolutely. I mean, I say this, this, uh, this, you know, we, we, the federate the the, 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 process was put in place in 13, following the, 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 the development 12, because those are certain articles. We have to get all the federations. They're, they're working it through the, yeah. the size of the bodies, not one, but they. They are committed to get that into place very quickly. Yep. But we will then be a regular monitoring of this departmentally and be able to come back and see where we are coming in this process to work that through, see what central initiatives we have to do in that process, uh, how can we, especially in the question of publicity, see how it connects into our wider fraud strategies and the process. But the, we are in early days. We will absolutely are, are there any sanctions built into your strategy? Should um, those who are charged with implementing it on the ground fall short of the park, in your view? I mean, there's two elements I can say. I mean, one of the things is obviously in our housing association uh, guides, okay. guidelines, or one of the process, one of the recommendations is that we put that 
very clear process into that, and therefore, as you know, as we're the regulator of it, and we will do that process there, and that becomes part of the regulation. And uh, the housing associations are very clear about the regulations and work very strongly to to make sure that they uh, fulfil their obligations. Likewise, we have very strong governance process with the housing uh, 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 executive. Um, and as I said, we have regular meetings at a variety of levels to check that what is being that it is delivered in that process. We also obviously have the NIO as our external auditors looking at this process. So there's a whole series of processes that are working through this. And as I say, at the same time, this fits into the departmental-wide anti-fraud strategy and the work we do with our, our fraud work in the SSA and the process connector. And there are very regular systems of linking that together because, as I say, one of the key services that everybody receives is our single investigatory service in the SSA actually acts on behalf of everybody. So it is connected and focused. Well, with all strategies, whether they're tactical or strategic, mm -hmm. you need to know at certain stages where you're supposed to be at mm -hmm. and if you're actually at there. Yes. And it's how you intend to crack. It's fine, as I've said, having a strategy. It's a starting point for everything. It's fine getting it rolled out. But unless you're able to monitor and check the progress against the milestones yes. that are built into it, it becomes difficult. You can, I don't want to go into the detail, no, but, sure. but are you content that the milestones yeah. are there, that the checking mechanisms are there, and that there are sufficient branch lines from the strategy to actually fulfil the yeah. objective? Should we have view? overall strategies in that process. What I've, I said the, from the very outset, and question, you've been questioning me a lot about what's the size of the problem, what's the issue here, and I've said, look, we need still survey works to get a really stronger feeling on that issue. We have got the management information put into the housing executive and the reporting systems now it's starting to flow so we get the suspected cases and we're working, we'll work that through to the system. And we have to then get all those templates through. And then it becomes a subsection of our general housing, uh, anti, uh, uh, connected with our housing benefit fraud work. It becomes a subsection of our fraud strategy and is reported on that basis. And that will give us the put. And I say, you know, the department has very strong systems in this area, and it fits naturally into that area. It's a complex bit of, of uh, anti-fraud activity, because as we've described in here, some very complex cases and how you get that process and people moving and what's their intention. But we want to get that correctly done. Okay. Um, I, I must say, in my experience, that the housing benefit section of the housing is a performing in a fantastic manner. Yeah. Uh, certainly, in terms of getting back to any queries that I have, and they do tend to be associated with fraud. And I just want to clarify, um, the starting point for all of this is, is housing benefit and payment, because if you've got a tenant they're not paying housing benefits, it's unlikely they're going to be committing benefit fraud. If housing benefit is getting paid, that's not to say that everybody who's in housing benefit is, is going to, but it's certainly more difficult for them to if housing is not in payment. And, and I think the starting point for all of this would be where housing benefit is in payment. Mm -hmm. uh, beyond that, if you bought a television set recently, you'll have somebody knocking on your door and say two days once you've got a TV licence. Mm -hmm. So there are ways that state agencies can check. Yes. And to, to me, they're not rocket science. Um, well, again, sorry, you're getting the brunt of this. Um, why before? Well, why before now did the department not require the department not require a dedicated policy fraud strategy from both the housing executive and the associations? Yeah. When the evidence from England was patently pinging on the radar that there was an issue. As I explained, at the moment, actually, as you said, the evidence pinged in, in GB. We were right; it, it was straight away. I mean, it was actually one month later. Uh, after the GB statement uh, that actually yeah. uh, housing executive was already working on this issue and broadening this issue out, so which you know, and we're seeing a lots of initiatives from did, GB. Did, did and the activity in Northern Ireland start within the housing executive or start within the department? It was the housing executive led in the process here because they were they were the ones connected in, into the process. But I'm uh, sorry, I, that's I did you know, with respect to address my question to the department. Yeah, no, it's, and it's it's uh, if, if, but the point is we were aware of the work because we were also obviously aware of the Blitz 2008 stuff, which even predates that we knew that they were on the case and we knew very we picked up very quickly that they were doing that they were doing this consultation within in a month so they were on the case and I would very the, readily make the point the, the executive in this case was ahead of the department would it be true to say that? absolutely I mean that, that I've no we work in, in close partnership yes, on this issue no. I'm not um, I, I'm no You're question I very much credit to him. absolutely I'm a big fan of the executive not well as a question it's not your name. <laughs> Uh, will the housing associations be required to produce tenancy fraud strategies 
at what stage will they be required to produce them or will they be bound by the strategy developed by the executive or tailored by the executive? I, I think it's a big, the key. How, how will you ensure a coordinated uh, strategic approach yeah. across all local social housing providers? Okay. Two I mean, elements is, I say, the, the housing yeah. associations have already committed themselves to producing this. Right, in, and in are well advanced. In advanced. Yeah. But the key point, it will become part of the regulatory requirement. So we, we have, a, we do, as you know, regular revisions of our guides and, and the next time but it'll go into that process to make sure by the, end, by the end of this month. Uh, so, so, and at the same so and at the same time then of course you're asking about best practice and how it's gathered together yeah. the northern Ireland, uh housing uh the, the anti-fraud forum uh, in relation to this uh tenancy fraud forum will be exactly the body which will make sure that connects i just want to get this right man so originally the provider of social housing was the executive one provider then for reasons that are um, historical, we developed these the Associate. housing associations mm -hmm. on the fringes of that. Are we now going to replicate that slight disjointedness by having one set of protocols adopted by the housing executive who are responsible for housing benefit and a self-policing set of protocols brought forward by the associations? And, or is it going to be a standard? a standard strategy and yeah. set of protocols okay. across everywhere because the housing benefit is the source of all this and that comes through the executive? Well, the housing benefit is actually, they're, they're acting as agents of the department in a sense. Oh, that I understand that, but they're the source. Um, but actually the issues of these things are more, they're wider obviously than the housing benefit as mm. we've described. I mean, it's, oh, it's, it's, it's a starting point um, for them though. I mean, I suppose the answer is we are not uh, laying down uh, one template and say that you must do exactly this process here. I would be extremely surprised when all the, the housing associations have produced, I think, their, their strategies, that they are not actually fairly similar. Mm. So as, we, as, as, as Cameron has made the point is, you know, small associations where people actually literally are walking, you know, the St Matthews solution will be somewhat different from the Apex solution. Mm. Um, the, the fold or the, the, the very sheltered housing processes where people are dropping in with tenants three times a day, their processes will be somewhat different. Mm -hmm. And I would want to make sure that that's absolutely right. People should do it the right way. But there will be a commonality and clearly as we regulate and look at those things, we'll want to make sure and check that we're happy that they brought it. But it will be done in a sort of collective process, and you know, I'm sure that's what Cameron is, yeah. is seeking to achieve, and knowing yeah. that, that that's the culture in which the associations are working. Yeah. Housing associations are already far advanced in in developing their strategies, and by late summer, early autumn, I think that we'll have almost almost complete coverage of of, of fi finalised strategies. And who is responsible for the approval if approval is necessary? Well, I think I, I, I suppose in in the first instance, obviously, the the board of each association. <coughs> is responsible for ensuring that they have robust governance procedures to tackle tenancy fraud and, and all other aspects of housing management, but the, the department in its regulatory capacity will be, um, through its inspection process, ensuring that, that those controls are robust and that associations' tenancy fraud strategies are, are, are adequate and are strong. Um, but we're already working, I think, across the piece with the department and the housing executive through the Northern Ireland Tenancy Fraud Forum to share good practice, um, to share, for example, draft documents so that we, we get consistently good practice across Northern Ireland. Um, for example, uh, the housing associations and the housing executive have had joint staff, um, staff training in this area, and uh, you know, we're working on a range of activity together. So, although Although each association may have a slightly different approach, I think as a result of this sharing of good practice, as a result of the, 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 the baseline that the Housing Association Guide will provide, I think we can be confident that there will be good, robust systems in every association. I, I, I just share with respect, and, and finally, I, I did note uh, um, Will's comments about some of the smaller housing associations, but you'll be very aware that the activities of some very small housing associations in certain matters of like allocations and ramifications that shook the whole system to its core. Mm -hmm. So the fact that they're small doesn't mm -hmm. particularly matter. It's the fact that they all operate in a broadly speaking similar manner and don't disadvantage any section of the community for, for any reason, which is why I'm a great believer in a standard education right across the board, if it's at all possible, for these to be protocols. Thanks, Will. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, Deputy Chairperson, Mr. Dallas. Uh, Chairperson, thanks. Uh, maybe I could move on to the, well, back perhaps to the issue of collaboration. Uh, 
obviously, uh, just maybe to pick up on your last points, Mr. Watt, is there collaboration between your different housing associations in terms of who might be the potential frost? At the moment, um, I, I suppose there is there is collaboration in tackling this in, in terms of the sharing of good practice. At the moment, um, there is some information sharing between associations, and we've also got an information sharing protocol uh, with the housing executive that hopefully can help tackle tenancy fraud and and other issues. Um, but I think in order to um, be fully <coughs> as effective as I think we want to be and need to be in this matter. I think we do need better information sharing um, between, so, uh, for example, with utilities companies, so that we can, if we suspect that a property is not being used, we can get as of right uh, from the NIE or Phoenix or whoever the information we need to see whether electricity and gas has been used. So there, there, there is sharing of information and good practice across associations and across uh, social landlords more generally. But I think information sharing uh, and better information sharing protocols is really important. Uh, to what extent are the housing associations participating in the National Fraud Initiative? At the moment, up, up, up to this point, the National Fraud Initiative in Northern Ireland has been entirely public sector bodies. No non-statutory bodies have participated in the National Fraud Initiative. As you know, housing associations, although we are delivering a major public service, we are, we are charitable organisations, we are social businesses. Um, one of the, the recommendations of the report, as you know, is that we consider housing associations participating in the National Fraud Initiative and other data matching exercises. Um, we have worked with the NIAO to, to get a briefing explaining uh, the National Fraud Initiative and what it might offer to associations. We have also hosted the NIAO at one of our, our seminars, housing management seminars with members to explain the, the National Fraud Initiative and how it might help associations tackle tenancy fraud and other issues. As a result of that, um, Helm Housing Association, I believe, have already signed up to participate on a tr trial basis in the next round of the National Fraud Initiative in Northern Ireland, which I think is encouraging. And I, I think I know that one or two other big associations are very seriously considering um, whether and how they can participate in the next round of the National Fraud Initiative. So I think that um, we're, we're very open to using it. And I think if, if two or three big associations uh, participate in the next round on a trial basis, then hopefully, if that goes well, we can, we can broaden that out to the rest of the movement for the, the round after that. How much of this activity uh, is generated through the Tenancy Fraud Forum? The, the, the Tenancy Fraud Forum is, is, is relatively new, but I think it, it already has been um, it already has been useful, I think, in, in for example, um, getting joint training between the housing executive and housing associations, bringing over t uh, experts from GB to do you know, awareness raising. Also issues around um, information sharing, for example, which are across social housing. We're, we're, we're addressing those through the forum. Um, we've only had a few meetings so far, so I think it, we're in our early days, but I think, there's, I think we've got some um, we are developing a work programme, and I think it will be a very useful vehicle to ensure that we get consistently robust action um, across all social landlords. It seems, Mr. Watt, there is not a lot to do. I think, that, I think, there, is a, I think there is a lot more that we, we can do, you know, for example, um, using the latest technology like the National Fraud Initiative, using housing management tools that allow us to um, get better information. For example, I, I spoke about the, the, the key fob data, for example. So new, new tools are, are coming along all the time. But I, I would say that we're starting from a, a sound base of very good, robust housing management in both the, the housing executive and housing associations. And I think by um, codifying and unifying a lot of that action with a specific focus on tenancy fraud will allow us to do, to do even better. You did mention your relationship with the utilities. At what stage is that in terms of electricity, telephone, water? Yeah. So uh, up to this point, our members, when they have tried to get access to information from um, utility providers, particularly the electricity companies, it has been, it's been hit and miss. 
Sometimes they've been able to get access to information about whether or not electricity has been used, how much it's being used. Um, sometimes now, with, with a lot of meters being on the, the outside of homes, associations are training up their staff to actually um, be able to read themselves whether electricity has been used. Um, but uh, uh, as far as uh, at this point, in terms of formal information sharing protocols, we've, we've yet to formalise those, and I know that the housing executive have actually been leading on that. Jerry may wish to comment, and we're hoping that as the housing executive formalise those, we'll be able to um, arrange similar protocols for our members. I just wonder, the, the Public House Committee, if you're on it long enough, tend to come back to the same things again. Another public accounts committee, of which I'll not be a member in, say, four or five years' time. Will all this stuff be accomplished? All the things that you have set out? I'm confident that we'll have made very good progress. I think, as I said, I think that this report is very useful. It has a number of, you know, really practical actions that we're, we have been progressing in the in the months since it's been published. Um, and I'm confident, working with our members, working with partners in DSD. Housing Executive and the NIO, we will make good progress in the next couple of years on all this. Would you be happy to provide a progress report on a regular basis as to what you've just promised? Um, well, I, I think I would like to. Ideally, I would like to dovetail any progress report to this committee with our, our regulatory well, and inspection know, requirements. Do you know, Mr. Watt, that you're very keen to involve the Housing yeah. Executive in this? I'm quite competent to ask them their questions. I'm focusing on the Housing mm. Association. I think we're. Um, I'm happy to provide progress reports. I think ideally, um, in order to minimise the already significant compliance requirements that our members face, I would like those to be aligned with our regulatory requirements, which are being enhanced by the, for example, DSD. So, for example, one of the, the recommendations of the report is that housing associations report, and, and I think the, the housing executive report progress against a broader range of measures for tenancy fraud than just um, recovery of abandoned properties. And so, in order, in order not to create a, a much uh, a whole new reporting mechanism and data gathering exercise, I think if we could, um, as I said, align um, our updates to this committee with, with, for example, the data that's been collected through housing associations' annual regulatory returns. I think that would be in everyone's interests. But in terms of reporting against progress, yes, well, we're, we're absolutely happy to do that. Just finally, Chairperson, uh, you did uh, certainly make it very clear you're a charity, yep. but you are aware that you do consume a lot of public money, and hence the reason why the Public Accounts Committee is interested in how that money is spent. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. We're, 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 we're social enterprises, but we are also charities. We're providers of a major public service. Housing associations are matching government investment pound for pound to, to build new homes. I think it's a very successful model and allows a lot more social housing to be provided in Northern Ireland than could be provided through public investment alone. But as, as providers of major public services, we recognise that we're fully accountable, and we are, of course, subject to regulation from DSD as the housing regulator, the new Charity Commission, <coughs> and RQIA for care and support services. So we, we fully understand our regulatory obligations and, and seek to fulfil them um, as well as we can. Mrs. Lightbody, just in case you feel left out of it, are you prepared to give the Public Accounts Committee the same under undertaking? Uh, absolutely. In, in terms of delivering what we say, we will be reporting on our action plan to the board. I am happy to give whatever data at whatever frequency to this committee and in whatever form suits. That is fine, Chairperson. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Mr Hazard. Thanks, Chair. And Ms Lightbody, just on the back actually, of um, what the Deputy Chair was asking, um, do you feel the Housing Executive have made enough of uh, credit data matching? Here in the north, I know we've seen throughout the report um, that it has been used quite effectively, actually across the way uh, in Britain. Um, is there scope here to improve what we're doing? Yeah, on, on um, credit data matching, 80% of our customers are in receipt of benefit support, so we'll use that to do mm. the host of data matching through public systems. But for the 20% of, of customers that Pay, pay rent to us. We have been looking at the use of credit reference facilities, so we have been pricing that up. It is again to make sure in that, though, that our actions are proportionate 
So using that as a facility where we have suspicion, where we have other triggers, rather than for every customer getting into that, as soon as you make a, a credit reference check, you are leaving a, a footprint on someone's credit history of a check having been done. So we, we want to check the cost of that and use it proportionately, but it will be a, a, a useful piece of intelligence in the puzzle for us. Yeah. You see, even just across the board, we've heard quite a bit today actually about um, be it the, the MBUS team or the, the forum across the way or anything. F from a perspective from the North, who's taking the lead um, in this collaboration if we're looking at sharing good practice across each of the organisations? And you know who's responsible for taking the lead, and equally disseminating that information down and throughout yeah. the systems, be it housing associations, be it the housing executive. You know who, who do we know in two or three years' time, for example, to hold to account if the sharing of good practice hasn't worked? Uh, the, the the lead connection into to the the, the national fraud forum is the housing executive association process. Uh, it is a joint collaboration. That the, the, the local one is a joint mm -hmm. collaboration of, of the three uh, the department, the housing association and. Uh, the, the, the Housing Association and, and the IHE. So, I mean, ultimately, I suppose the department has to be mm. responsible because of the, of the oversight. Uh, it is public money issues or, uh, that we have to take the lead on that issue. But on the best practice and other issues, I mean, we've got very active involvement connection through the housing executive. So, it is a genuine partnership process here. But I suppose the accountability line ultimately comes first to the department, and then we yeah. connect to 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 uh, housing executive and housing associations. And do you feel you know, that the dissemination of the good practice is getting right down to neighbourhood officers and right down to the areas where it's needed? Well, already, I mean, as I say, one of the early actions, and I say with a very full action, there's already 300 staff, uh, both of the housing executive and the housing associations, have already uh, undertaken training uh, in, this, in, in the last autumn and early spring, uh, in my understanding, uh, and that has been rolled out for, for all staff in, in the process. So I think there's, there are good. I mean, I think the, the key question is how do you get to make sure that uh, it gets to, to all staff? The point has been already made about the importance of consistency in all offices, the fact you've got a common reporting system and if I understand right, techniques and software to kind of do that. I think that will also hopefully put that process in place. So I think there is a real capacity to do that, but it, all these things take time to make sure that that does get in place. And even just finally, Chair, just picking up on the capacity, um, we're going into the process obviously now with RPA, mm. uh, and we're going to have you know, you, you know, a collection now of an increased amount of community agencies and community activity mm. at a level which we maybe didn't have before. Do you see that as a help or a hindrance in this, or you know, what potential is it for increased collaboration at that community level that we maybe haven't seen before? Well, it's, I mean, it's, I think it's maybe ask. I mean, maybe the housing director comment. I mean, that the, you have very strong, if I understand how to say, very strong tradition of stro strong connection with the community as such, and there's a big focus. So, and, and I think that's something which you are. I mean, you, yeah, yeah. You make, you make a very valid point as we look forward. Um, in terms, of if you if you look at the structure of our house, we we've kept our local outlets, but we've reconfigured our management arrangements in around the potential shape of the new councils, so that we're providing services along those broad council boundaries. Uh, we have increasingly worked with our community network, who are out in our community staying daily, with a view to them helping us um, shape and improve our services. Uh, and as we move forward with the setting up of the 12 new super councils, there is a huge potential there for us to sit down and work closely with them in terms of the services we are delivering, bearing in mind that the future of the councils is about developing community plans, yeah. and housing is a key element of community planning. Mm. I definitely agree, and you know, certainly looking at it from a down perspective, you know, we have housing executive and council all in the same building the same now. Building, so yeah. you would like to think, surely, that the potential is yeah. there. Mm. Is there actual plans then in place about how you know? Is there a work plan, a schedule that you're working to then to start this engagement, or is it still sort of in the ether of an idea that you know collaboration is now easier with RPA? Jerry will come in in more detail. Um, I'm arranging to, to meet with the, the, the executives, the shadow executives and the new organisations, just to how will we best work together. Formal arrangements will be around all of the councils, as we do every year. We are district housing plans, getting down to the detail of what's happening in the areas and gives the opportunity for, for different joint working together. Um, fairly, fairly extensively engaged just now, but with RPA, it's the time again again for us to refresh and see if we can do things differently. I suppose the only thing I would add to that would be that in addition, you know, we've just come from our board away there where we intend 
uh, as a regular theme in the board meeting going forward to pick each of the district councils and have that connection. What are the key issues that are facing them that we start to build those networks as we move forward? That's for our board yeah. actually to, instead of our Belfast meetings, actually to take the board yeah. meetings out yeah. and about and connect with the councils that way. <coughs> one of the ideas. Yes. Similarly, housing associations recognise that we need to work more closely with local government, particularly with uh, local government taking on planning and regeneration powers. If we're going to get new social homes built where they're needed, we have to have very good links with the, the officials and councillors. And so NIFA, as the trade body for housing associations, will be facilitating much, much more close engagement with officials and all the new councillors. <laughs> Um, I think primarily around the planning and delivery of new social homes, but obviously those relationships can hopefully help in tackling tenancy fraud and other issues. Chair, just one last point. Actually, I forgot to mention we have talked today about um, the collaboration, perhaps with Britain. What about cross-border collaboration? Um, there, I'm sure there are bound to be examples of subletting, you know, peoples in both jurisdictions on the island. Is it something that? See, the, um, the, in, in, they're only now establishing sort of formal regulation of, of, of social housing in, in, in the south. And um, I'm about to go to Glasgow, where the, the, the four federations of housing associations in the UK and actually the, the five regulators, including the emerging regulator in the south, is, it, is joining us to try and share good practice. And I think tenancy fraud is something that I will raise. And if there is work we can do on tenancy fraud across the border, we will certainly look at doing that. Yeah, I think your point your point's well made. We have had previous connections, with, particularly in our Uri and Moran offices, with the DOC okay. Council. And as an organisation in the past, we have worked with the Corporation in Dublin. But in terms of this, it has been a national initiative now. There is scope here to sit and, and look to expand that. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr Rogers. Thanks, Chair. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, in paragraph 42, it states the approach to tackling um, tenancy fraud in Northern Ireland is quite unstructured. And when I look at, and granted what you've said earlier, that this tenancy fraud strategy is a, is a, is a, is a working document yeah. at the minute. And I look at point number 11 there, it says, in order to detect the tenancy issue of fraud, in, the housing executive can take reports by phone about tenancy misuse or fraud. That's quite to me, a quite a lame statement. It says further on they could use a link on the website as well. I suppose my question here, first of all, really is when somebody makes that call, how is that line managed? Can I ask him just in, in terms of processing um, dealing with tenancy yeah. fraud? Can I make a query? Yeah. yeah. Um, the way our system works, and so for example, if you remember the public and you just ring our dedicated number, uh, that number is recorded and passed into the local office, the uh, local housing manager passes that call directly to the housing officers who are responsible for that patch for them to engage in a series of um, investigations to determine. So the first port of call would be check the data we have in terms of relation to that tenancy and then to follow that up with a visit. And that's, I suppose, the bedrock upon which our abandonment process is built, um, gathering intelligence to determine whether an individual is there or not, and then following that through, followed up usually with a visit, uh, a calling card, second visit. The second calling card followed up by a letter giving you a seven-day notice that we're going to serve an abandonment procedure against you, which is a 28-day notice. Uh, if no one comes back, uh, then sorry, how is that served to me uh, to the house? Where I'm talking about somebody's the house is empty. Up in the window. Yeah, and they Post live. It's a formal abandonment doors. notice. Um, and if they're not living in the property, we serve a notice on the property. There's a letter sent and there's a notice pinned on the door. And if that was not answered within 28 days, the executive legally repossess that property, go in, change the locks, uh, and reallocate that property. But if, but if it is answered and they, they're in the house when you arrive? Then you form a process of identification. Can you confirm uh, name, national insurance number, date of birth? If people answer that, for example, you're Mr Rogers, can you confirm it's your date of birth and it's your national insurance number? Then we follow that with one. Can you give us um, form of proof uh, through uh, a passport? Can you give us photographic evidence? Because sometimes someone was trying to defraud you, <coughs> know the name of the person, they might have their personal details, we follow that up with confirmation of photographic evidence. And that's what happens in a lot of the cases where we serve abandonment notices. You can see from the numbers we're serving and the number we're repossessing, there's a fall out rate of about 50 to 60 per cent. That's because people do produce evidence that they are living there. And um, For those who don't, those are the ones that we formally repossess. If I present the evidence and so on, but <coughs> once you go away, I go four doors up to my girlfriend and go back and live there. Yeah. 
Do you have any follow up after that? Then? Yeah, we, we, we do. So if, some, if someone provides the right answers um, and you draw a line on that, um, we have on occasion had reports from community people saying, listen, those people are only there one day a week because they are somewhere else. We continue to follow that up. Um, and the proof, and this is always having the evidence, we wish to secure the property. Uh, and the issue for that case, if someone is there temporarily and moving on, is getting sufficient evidence to allow you to repossess the property. Because people do have a right to be out of their properties. So always the burden of proof is having the evidence. And that's where you find most of our abandonments are served on vacant properties, because the person doesn't turn up. Those who do turn up and challenge are the ones we end up in the court system. Would the data management, data management this day be suffice to, to, to do that? For example, would you, John talked about linked with the utilities. If there's no, electric, if there's yeah. no units been used electricity bill, would it be linked with the local councils in terms of bin collections? Would it be linked with you know, all other things? There's a, a, there's a range of checks carried out in those investigations. You, know, you can check the electrical register, but then not everybody's on the electrical register. You can check with utilities. And some of the issues out of the, the recent programme was that ability to share data with utility companies because prior to deregulation they were a public body and it was easy to get that information. We've recently been working with them to set up a new forum which would allow, for example, the utility providers to share that information with us. We've got evidence that Mr Rogers is no longer living at this. What's his electricity usually like? So we're starting to create um, data exchange um, arrangements to allow us to gather that information which would add weight to the evidence you were gathering to determine that you weren't there. We do also have the credit reference or cross checking in terms of our people purchasing things through credit and getting delivery to other places, for people on benefits, um, and are they getting benefits paid at a different address? We do all of those checks to gather the evidence as robust as you possibly can to retrieve the property. The word robust was used er earlier in terms of this national fraud initiative yeah. and this data matching. On a scale of 1 to 10, how robust is your system at the minute? It's pretty robust. Um, could it be better? You can always get better. And the more you do this, the more you do exercises, the more you share best practice with others, the sharper you get at doing things, you can build on that a robust. Uh, I believe we have a sound and fairly robust approach, um, but there's always room for improvement. But it's not up near 10? Um, no, and I don't believe it ever could be out of 10. Okay. Um, uh, and just on the same page of the uh, tenancy on uh, number 16, all reports of potential tenancy misuse fraud will continue to be fully investigated. Um, I suppose, in terms of the investigation and so on, how many cases, and we heard earlier about the Blitz and so on in 2008, I might just go back three years, say, to, say 2012, 2013, and 2014. How many cases were reported to the, the Audit Office in 2012? Of suspected fraud, 2013, and even up to now in 2014. I think, as I mean before, I've given you the ones that that um, uh, the ones that are being pursued here, but because the abandonment issues were not were not being forwarded to the department, they were being seen as housing management. We weren't at that period doing uh, at that process. We've now got a situation where we're transferring to every suspected fraud. We are looking. We are starting to get that one. Transferred to the the, the audit office uh, at first time, but in those early days, no, the answer was not because this was being looked at a uh, contractual management issues, and they, we were not being it was not being transferred to the department. It was that shift from looking at it as a man housing management issue to to seeing it as a fraud issue, which came into uh, 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 last year. But that's it's only now that we're starting to get the flow of those fraud cases through in that case because we've reclassified in a sense them from. A housing contractual issue, which wasn't reported to the housing, uh, to the NIO, which now are putting them as fraud issues. So none were in 2012 or 2013. Mm -hmm. Has been any in this year? Uh, we, we're just developing uh, this week with uh, 80. I think have been sent. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, this, yeah, this, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Month of April. Uh, one was reported uh, a few months ago. Yeah. Uh, but prior to the publication of this report, I had no cases reported, and that was one of the reasons why we got interested in, in the topic. Thank you.
you can see um, the sceptic in me would say that once this report came out, it was just shot across the bows to DSE in that. We were quite open about the issue. I mean, the point is, before this was seen, it was not seen as a. It was not. An, it was seen as a, a key yeah. issue of managing contract issue. It was not seen, and we, we put our. We're quite clear. It has. It has changed the focus of how we look at this issue, and we totally. You know, we think it is a sharper focus on this issue. We need to work out exactly how to to get this right in the process uh, in this way. But we have no arguments with the NIO on this issue. It was pointed out earlier that, in terms of what was happening across the water, that you're picking up the discussions and keeping an eye on things. Why, in retrospect, it, was this not picked up earlier? With these abandoned. Well, I, I mean, broad, uh, broad issue. I mean, the answer was, I mean, we were, we, for example, we we were doing exercise even before really GB got going. The the, the Blitz program of twenty. 2008 was, in a sense, uh, you know, very early on in the process, and that was the housing sector was feeling it was strongly on, on top of the management issue in that one. Um, so, um, but I say it was because the perspective that it was a it was a housing management issue, and that was the perspective everybody had. But that was a one which was common, in a sense, right across the entire housing sector in the British Isles. In a sense, what we're seeing is this shift and saying, actually, you can look at this in a different way. It is ultimately the misuse of a bit of, of, of public investment, and we have to get. We are, it is a fraud issue in that sense. That's the shift. Right, okay. Sorry, Mr. Flynn. Just going back to the earlier thing, the earlier point about the telephone. Do you think the introduction of a tenancy fraud hotline would be a good idea? Yeah, I think genuinely the introduction of a number that people can contact as a quick and um, automatic. Um, Response to their view of a property being empty is a good thing, and hence we have a, a number on our on our website, which is our general number that's redirected to our local office. We are in discussions um, with the department and others about having a dedicated fraud number, and I think the more we do uh, the detailed searches to identify the scale of this, the more you look at the potential for having a specific number. In previous years, there was a national fraud number that people used to use, which was on our website, which was all about any sort of fraud, housing benefit fraud or whatever that was used. In fact, we have highlighted specifically on our on our website now that if you suspect someone of not living on a property that should and has a property in the housing sector, ring this number and we will follow it up. And the true test is, and that's what we've been doing. We, we had reviewed whether a, a different number would be mm. better, but again, most customers know the number. Know the They've got it maybe pinned in the house, but as soon as that call comes through, it, it's routed through, so it's, it's captured properly, managed properly, staff report it in a consistent way, um, and we, we can get a single handle on, on what's happening there. Uh, and I've, I've tried it as a secret shopper, phoning in and also going online to make sure the responses are, are, are um, as we've, we've set out today. So um, consistency there and how, how we're doing it. But the, the added bit is perhaps having one number for the whole sector. Mm. And that, that's the bit that we'll, we'll consider yeah. whether that might be a better approach. Mr. Herr, you, you believe that the one number for the for the complete site would be a good idea? Um, well, I, I, want to, I want to check. I mean, certainly we're trying to get a consistent. Uh, uh, it needs to be looked at. What is the best communication tools? I'm not an expert in working out. You know, because as you say, people have got a good sense of hey, they know the housing executive main call number. In that process, you say it's the one which people are more accessible to people. Uh, if you have a, a separate number, the danger is how do people know what that number is in that process? Unless you publicise you. But it, it, it's one which I think we, we need to investigate and, ma and make a call on it sometime fairly soon. Uh, uh, we have, there's, there's different tendencies in government of whether you go for distinct numbers or a general number everybody has, but very well handled, and that, that you get the, a number of queries rooted through that one. And uh, that's the issue we have to decide on. I think for the housing executive, we're obviously keen, as I'm mm. sure sector colleagues will be, that as soon as we get the call, we can, we can action it from, from going live with it. Um, three of the calls we've had in in the month of April mm. were for, for associations. Mm. Mm. So we've, we've been a bit of a gatekeeper before we've agreed it to get them straight through to the associations for, for management, but taking care of our own business as well. I just when I, when I opened, I talked about the, uns, the report talks about the unstructured nature of the um, of tackling tenancy fraud. What do you think are the key learning points out of this report in order to make tenancy fraud history? Well, it'd be difficult to make it history, but yeah. to improve the situation. I, I mean, I think this it's one. It's, it's, now we have a recognition that there's an issue in a sense. It's, we saw it in a different perspective. It is now seen as an issue which can be dealt with in this way. 
And as we have done with other areas of fraud, we, it's a, it is about a question of how do you make sure your data matching there, your information, your your, your hotlines, etc. How do you connect this together? How do you get it connected across organisations? How do you get those process? So, in a sense, we'll apply those rules, which are very, which we've dealt with generally in benefit fraud, and connect it into the system here. And the key question for us is having a regular reporting system um, of making sure that we are actually checking what's going through this process. There is, a, a, and the, the different parts of the system, from the housing associations to the housing executive. That we are getting, a cons we are looking at the data coming in there. We're seeing how they are applying it. We're making sure that's effectively regulated in that process, and at the same time, that the practitioners are meeting together regularly um, within the tenancy fraud forum to learn in the process. Because it's, as you say, as we demonstrate here, it's quite a complex set of issues around that. So we do that work together, and I think the other bit, which is people who may be doing tenancy fraud. There may be a housing benefit fraud. There may be another fraud, for a fraud in the process here. And as I think as we do data matching in a much more consistent way, and we are developing that very strongly, uh, those things, I think, will start building up a strong platform and process in, in that way. And uh, you know, so I think it's just about having a systemized process going through that. And you know, getting some metrics on it and saying, where do we think we are? And then trying to measure how far we have achieved it, but it, it is a complex bit of. Uh, 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 of uh, and may I say it's also one where we have to work delicately in this process. There will be cases of people who, who are, uh, who are older people who are in transition, moving out of social homes into maybe care homes, and we yeah we have to make sure they they tell us the right time so we can get the home for somebody else. But there are lots of things we just there's a customer care angle, for the many you know. The public tenants who are absolutely legitimate in what they're doing. We must be careful to do this, not to to frighten people who are in those yeah. difficult situations. I'm sure you'd share that uh, uh, as representatives. Yeah. Thank you, because I think you know, as as members of the Public Accounts Committee, mm -hmm. we're concerned how the public purse is used. But yeah. I think each one is as individual representatives of our, yeah. our constituents. Yeah. As Ross said earlier, we have so many people, genuine people out there that need a home and can't get yes. one. So, yeah. 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 Okay, thank you, Mr. Rogers. Um, just a couple of questions before we wind on, on this session. Um, the fraud forum was alluded to uh, quite a number of times. Uh, Mr. Hare, can you inform the committee um, who are they, how often do they meet, and who do they report to, mm. and what specific priorities do they have in place, and what are their targets to reduce tenancy fraud? Um, I'm going to ask uh, 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 Jim could just come just on, 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 on the general post. At this stage, may I say, it's, it is an early stage of the process, it's been in the formation of this uh, work. Is, uh, can, the setting of targets, as, as I think we've discussed here, is one where I think we, we have not yet got the targets set in this process uh, here, because I think us, we're looking for the early surveys and the work here to kind of give us a better sense of that metric and the process. But clearly, they have an action. There's a, a key action plan, uh, which is in place in this process. And in the first year, the key issue is to roll out all those actions and make sure that all those processes are in place. But Jim, do you want? To yes, certainly. The, the, the Northern Ireland Tenancy Fraud Forum was established in November. Um, it's hosted by the department, by, by the our, our regulation inspection head. It's got. Uh, three key focuses. The first is to take the audit office report, explore those areas of good practice, and implement what they can, and, and look at dissemination. And for that reason, one of its first actions was to create a formal link with the with the GP tenancy form, and that's led by the housing executive. It's also got two specific areas it's been asked to look at and can report back to the department. One is in the context of the legislation that we've talked about, and the value they think there might be in that legislation. And the second is about a single investigatory team, which was also a key recommendation. So we've tasked about those two early, early issues to look at. So it's got the best practice, how we disseminate that, to link with the wider tenancy forum in terms of UK, but also to look specifically at a number of issues. In terms of the targets, whilst each of the um, associations are doing some work around what should be the target, the priority is to put in place actions that will increase the level of detection that we've got at the moment and increase the level of returns that we have. So we really, rather than having a target 
for meeting. What we want to see is that the tenancy floor room is having an impact because we're seeing more homes brought back. The, 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 um, the shared training that we discussed, that the, the housing executive and the housing associations ran with GB experts, that, that came directly out of the work of, of the forum. And I think that's been very useful for, for, for all concerned. And we're also looking at, you know, for example, um, pr discussing how we take forward the protocols through that forum as well. So, um, early days, but I'm certainly finding it very useful, and I think my members are. Um, and just going back to my, my opening question in terms of, and obviously there are measures in place now, uh, I think it's still of the, uh, and I'm safe to say on behalf of the committee, it's still safe to say that our opinion is that, that your organisation was slow in proactively responding to this very serious issue. Um, compared to what was going on in G GB, and, and, and I think um, that and as you did stress that there are measures now in place, but albeit um, it had to prompt, I believe, um, the audit office to, to get the wheel in motion. Uh, just, uh, I want to uh, maybe mention the uh, APEX strategy that, that was mentioned earlier, that's forthcoming to the committee. That will be forthcoming to the committee. Yeah, very, I'm, I'm sure Apex will be very happy to provide it to the committee. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, uh, did you want in there? Just no, it was just just to come back to one wee point. Chair. Yeah. I appreciate you're on a bit of a roll there, but it was it's about data sharing, which is a vitally important area. But we know that data protection is a is a good loophole for not giving information, and it's used by the housing executive on many occasions. The likes of ourselves, and I'm sure it's used by agencies that you would try to contact in relation to investigations of these types of matter. Is there an agreement about the sharing of information with a view to where there's fraud, potential fraud being committed, that they will buy in and ensure that they give you that information, or is it a whole process? And I'm thinking of benefits in particular, which can be a difficulty because people don't always give you information. Um, just uh, the different organisations don't give you information. That's yeah. easier. I mean, the answer, I mean, there is an issue that public data is when we are, have collected data from individuals, we are meant to use it for the purposes for which it was collected, and therefore that has not We have done quite a lot of work, however, uh, uh, in, in recent years of trying to break down those barriers and making sure we've got legislative and other legal covers to make sure we can transfer. I think there has been significant progress being made across those issues, and, and I think we are continuing to do that. But there are important issues, and of course, there's the element that was, some of this was put in place to protect the public from that kind of big brother concept. Mm -hmm. But yet, we know on the other hand, it's legitimate this public information that it, there's important issues, counter arguments to that issue. So we have done uh, work on trying to break down some of those barriers and those issues. Um, we have to make sure that. We use data legally as we are required, um, but we are trying to. So it's we're often trying to get the the right legal background. But I, where I'm where I'm coming from, Chair, and this is just to come in on a point. If if there are areas that you have identified where you are having difficulty, and you think that there's areas that we as legislators could look at to ensure that those those are a more open forum mm. to allow that to happen, not to be abused, but to allow. I, I find in many occasions it's used as an excuse not to give you information as opposed to actually help you. you know, and I'm saying if you can maybe give us yeah. some indications of areas that we could ultimately look at and see if there's ways Good that point. we could help us move yeah. forward. Okay, okay. Um, members, um, uh, just to conclude, for every illegal tenancy, there's a homeless person who obviously stands mm -hmm. to lose out in a home. Mm -hmm. and I think that's a clear message that's been sent out here uh, today. There are 20,000 families that present to the housing executive and housing stress uh, each year, and around half of these are classes, uh, classified as statutory homeless, in which case the housing executive does have a duty to, uh, to those individuals. Obviously, the cost of tenancy fraud, we have heard about the social costs of such fraudulent activity, and this needs to be addressed as a matter of uh, a priority. And I note from the Audit Office report that in England, the government has provided £35 million to local authorities to prevent, detect and tackle tenancy fraud. Given the seriousness of this issue, uh, Mr Hare, does the DSD have any plans to provide additional funding here? Um, 
Um, uh, we have not, it's not an area where we've had any demand for requests for funds. The process, the housing executive from its resources has been very active in that already. But when it came down to it, many of the, I mean, looking at the grants, there's, you know, housing organisations were getting 10, 15,000 pounds, and when you actually push that money down the system, uh, we've already seen the housing executive uh, and the housing associations very willingly and without any request sees all these issues very proactively. So I must admit, there's, you know, it's not been a basically. And may I say, most of these initiatives are England. That's, we're not seeing this activity in Scotland. Scotland has not taken this as from our evidence. They are not pushing this issue in, in any sense. Process. But in England, uh, they've had to put money on the table to get to get, to get some of this going. But I say. The organisations here have moved without any financial. We have a thing called Invest to Save, yeah. uh, which uh, for every 100 houses received back in would save the Northern Ireland executive £800,000 in revenue per year, never mind the additional yeah. properties and housing benefit fraud or whatever yeah. is involved there. But £800,000 of benefit back into the Northern Ireland economy. Yeah. So. That's and we are in discussions about the whole question about investor saving arguments and about our entire benefit for others, an issue which we are discussing with DFP and more widely, um, because it is an area, as you know, the department is heavily invested in this area where uh, we're in, in that process. Thank you. Well, I think, in conclusion, we can all agree that social housing plays an important role in providing a home for some of the most vulnerable people in our society who are in dire need. And the evidence presented here today to our committee would seem to suggest that local uh, social housing providers, that we believe, as I said, have been slow in tackling um, this issue. However, I do take some comfort in the range of measures that are being proposed to tackle tenancy fraud more robustly. And indeed, this would seem to suggest that you have not maybe done that until now. Ultimately, a more robust approach will pay dividends in, you know, in long-term outcomes in tackling the issue of tenancy fraud and indeed homelessness and helping those most in need where that priority must lie. And as the Deputy Chairperson alluded to earlier, it is our job here to um, look at how public money is being spent. Um, obviously, it is within the taxpayers' interest to, to publicly know that as well. So, thank you for presenting here today. Maybe just to follow up on something I said earlier, and to concur entirely with what you have said, given that most of these initiatives seem to be only beginning, could I suggest that at some stage in the future, and not far into the future, we have a follow-up report on what is achieved? Absolutely. I think that is key. It is imperative that we do that. Okay, uh, thank you, um, thank you Mr. Hare, Lightbody, Mr. Thank Flynn, you. Mr. Wilkinson, and Mr. Watt. Thank you very much for coming thank here you. today. Thank you. Okay, members. Uh, moving on to our final piece of business. Um, members, um, any other business? Our next meetings will take place on Wednesday, the 28th, as we don't have any meeting next week due to the elections. Um, so it'll be the Wednesday the twenty eighth. So and I would ask members just if they can just to indulge a five more minutes. Maybe um here and if you your team want to come forward, maybe to do a debrief on the session. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so we're going to close session now, okay. Thank you. Oh sorry. <laughs>